Let's put ourselves in the presence of God. Dear Lord, we thank and praise you for this new day. You are our Lord, the giver of life, to whom we trust. Everything we have comes from you. Forgive us for all our failings and shortcomings. We ask for your mercy and grace. Thank you for all your blessings, especially the blessing of this gathering and our speakers. Bless our speakers that they may be able to share their wisdom and knowledge in accordance with your will and that we will have a fruitful and enlightening forum. Bless all of us here, um, including the participants and the organizers. May we glorify you today and in everything that we do. Lastly, Lord, bless our country. Lord, heal our land and our people. Do not abandon us and bring us closer to you. All this we ask through Christ your Son. Amen. Kindly remain standing for the Philippine National Anthem. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You may now take your seats. We will turn you over now to our Master of Ceremonies, a trustee of both Sherfield and the Institute of Corporate Directors. Let us all welcome Miss Aurora Boots Giotina Garcia. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. We are pleased to welcome you today to this joint forum on the revised Corporation Code changes and challenges. This event is a collaboration among several organizations all dedicated to the promotion and transformation of the landscape of Philippine business through the practice of good corporate governance. This forum, if I allow me to repeat, is brought to you by seven organizations in alphabetical order. The Financial Executives Institute, or Phoenix, the Institute of Corporate Directors, ICD, the Institute of Internal Auditors, Philippines, IIAP, the Judicial Reform Initiative, JRI, the Management Association of the Philippines, MAP, the Makati Business Club, MBC, and the Shareholders Association of the Philippines of Share or Sharefield. As you're aware, on February 21, 2019, President Duterte signed into law the revised Corporation Code, which amended the 38-year-old Corporation Code. The business community has awaited with much anticipation the passage of the amendments which were introduced to achieve or for the following reasons, among others, to simplify corporate governance standards, which would deter corporate fraud and support anti-corruption measures, as well as protect the rights of shareholders. To establish a more business-friendly environment, which will promote the creation of new businesses and contribute to the ease of doing business to incorporate international standards and best practices to address present day realities. And finally, to strengthen the regulatory authority of the Securities and Exchange Commission. I think we did anticipate this with much, uh, we came here with much anticipation. And if there's any indicate, that's a good indication is that we do have an 
full room today. We were practically overbooked that we had to decline some interest towards the early, later part of uh, the organization of this event. So we are all looking forward to this forum to enlighten us on the implications and impact of the amendments to our businesses and to our organization. We are awaiting the arrival of our keynote speaker, who is somewhere in the hotel, I believe. Uh, would any of the staff please find out? Are we going to reverse the program and have the keynote at the end? <laughs> Perhaps we can start with, can we have some information from the, from the uh, staff, please? Would anyone want to do a song and dance in the meantime, as an intermission? <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, my talents are kept uh, <laughs> just for myself. <laughs> Any updates on where the senator is? Well, I just mentioned that he is in the hotel. She's taking a short snack. With Francis Lin, who's also one of the speakers. <laughs> or presenters. Francis is strong. Okay, uh, we just had an update, two minutes. So could you please bear with us for two minutes? I assure you we, we will have a very interesting discussion today with all the important uh, personalities who have uh, contributed to the passage of the, of the amendments that we have today. I also wanted to mention that the majority of the audience here, I understand, are lawyers. Is that correct? So is it, are you here because you, you wanna, you know, skip having to analyze the law and just listen to Francie and all the lawyers around here and then go back and then, you know, start, uh, you know, reading in more detail. The, uh, the provisions which are most relevant to you. Maybe in the meantime, I could announce something that I'd like to invite you all to do for purposes of the Q&A later on. So we do have, a, if you would like to open your phone browser, and go to slido.com if you don't have it yet. Is everyone trying to get that on his phone now? Uh, can we have that on the screen? Okay, okay, there's the, there's the instruction as to how to avail of Slido. You go to slido.com, enter our event code, which is indicated there. RCC2019 and the password is DUSI112019 and then you can ask your questions or join the polls as the case may be because in between the Q&A we will also be asking some poll questions. Has everyone found Slido yet? Are you technically challenged? It's not as bad as you think it is.
So the Slido directions are there. If you just spend some time, of course, uh, I would, we would imagine that there will be a lot of questions that will be asked. So this is really one way we'd like to facilitate the Q&A portion so we can manage the questions that will be raised by the audience. So have you downloaded Saido? Okay. Are we, is he almost here? I think I think our keynote speaker is has just entered the ballroom. Good afternoon, Senator Frank. Let's allow him to take his seat. So we're just about ready to start the program proper and for that purpose, I'd like to call on the chairman of the Makati Business Club, a good friend, Ed Shua, to introduce our keynote speaker. Ed. Thank you uh, very much, Boots, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are very fortunate to have with us today the principal author of the revised Corporation Code of the Philippines. I've been asked to introduce him, but I know he doesn't need any introduction. But I think as we are approaching the elections in May, it would be good for us to be reminded of the qualifications of what would be good senator, you know, someone in the Senate, someone that we, we should be electing in May. Anyway, he served as Senate president for over eight years, one of the longest in Philippine history. Known as the big man of the Senate, he's one of the country's highly esteemed senators with an impeccable record in public service. He served in both the Aquino and Ramos cabinets as Labor Secretary, Justice Secretary, and Executive Secretary. He was elected senator in 1995 and served as Senate President from 2001 to 2006 and again in 2013 to 2016. In, 20, in the 2016 senatorial race, he topped the senatorial elections with over 18.6 million votes. He now serves as minority leader in the Senate, and in his 30 years of outstanding service to the nation, he has received numerous awards and citations, some of which I will just enumerate, the Philippine Legion of Honor, degree of commander, the degree of doctor of laws, honoris causa, by the University of the Philippines in 2014, and the Grand Cordon of the Order of the Rising Sun by Japan's Emperor Akihito and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, with great pride and honor, let's welcome Senate Minority Leader Franklin M. Drilon. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, let us just make it clear that that was not a campaign speech. <laughs> I am not a candidate. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much, Ed, for your very kind words. So let me formally greet you 
uh, Ed as the president of the Catholic Business Club, the chairperson of our Securities and Exchange Commission, Attorney Emilio B. Aquino, with whom I worked closely in the passage of this bill, my other good friend who steered the GCG law into a very successful instrument of governance, Attorney Cesar L. Villanueva, my good friend, uh, partner, senior partner in Acra Law, the only law firm in Manila. <laughs> Attorney Francis Lee, Parakpakanavin si Francis. Ms. Michelle Mendoza, the chair and president of the Institute of Internal Auditors of the Philippines. I will not greet the others, but let me uh, greet all of you, my fellow workers in government, members of the business community, guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very pleasant good afternoon. It is indeed an honor and privilege to speak before you today, and thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts with the esteemed members of the business community. Not too long ago, the Philippines was the rising star in Asia because of its remarkable economic growth, investment grade ratings, strong macroeconomics indicators, political stability, and earnest pursuit of good governance by the Aquino administration. The optimism and confidence of the international community were reflected in significant improvements in our global competitive, competitiveness and ease of doing business rate rankings, as well as our standing in the Corruption Perception Index survey done annually by the Transparency International. However, the latest World Bank Ease of Doing Business report showed the drop in our country's ranking from 113 in 2018 to 124th in 2019 among 190 countries. In the previous report, the drop was bigger at 14 points. In total, the country's rank has dropped by 25 notches since 2017. Moreover, our gross domestic product went down from six to 6.2% last year, from a high of 6.7% in the previous year. These figures are indeed alarming. My dear friends, it is in this context that we have tried to do our share by introducing reforms in legislation. Introducing reforms requires passion and commitment, and more importantly, political will. When we opened the 17th Congress in 2016, I filed a number of measures along economic and institutional reforms. On top of this list was the revision of the decades-old corporation code. The old law, which was created during a far different time in our country, already had outdated policies. With the enactment of the Revised Corporation Code, or RCC, we made critical changes that would create an environment conducive for business to thrive and prosper. In general, the Revised Corporation Code contains four reform clusters. First, we placed policies that will enhance the ease of doing business in the Philippines. Second, we strengthened stockholders' protection and institutionalized corporate governance provisions. Third, we institutionalized provisions that will instill corporate civic responsibility. And fourth, we strengthened the country's policy and regulatory corporate framework, enhancing the ease of doing business. To address our dismal starting a business rating of 97.97 of and ranking only 166 out of 190 economies in the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business survey, the revised corporation code introduced 
seven key reforms. First, the removal of prior to incorporation endorsements from different government agencies. Second, the adoption of electronic filing and monitoring systems. Third, the adoption of streamlined incorporation process, starting with a simplified name verification standard and procedure. Fourth, shift to perpetual corporate term. Fifth, the introduction of a one-person corporation so that Ed here would not have to have his staff and his household help as incorporators. <laughs> Improvement on stockholders and directors' participation in the corporate decision-making. And seventh, the removal of the subscribed and paid-up capital requirements. These are the seven, seven key reforms that we introduced in the revised Corporation Code. We are doing away with the tedious pre-incorporation and pre-operation endorsements, save for the financial institutions, which would still require the endorsement of the Banco Central of Philippines. The shift to distinguishability standard for corporate names will result in a faster and more convenient registration process. We remove the subscribed and paid up requirements in keeping with the worldwide trend. Corollary to this, the requirement that majority of the incorporators must be residents of the Philippines has been deleted. One of the significant amendments under the law is the introduction of the One Person Corporation or OPC. Another reform is the grant of perpetual corporate terms. This will do away with the cumbersome and, extensive, and expensive process of re-registering a corporation or reviving a corporation. In the first place, we do not understand this, why this requirement is there. But anyway, we deleted it. And again, who among you have never done paper minutes. Attorney Francis Lee Muir is an expert in doing paper minutes. <laughs> Although no one will confess to it, certainly not Francis Lee. Many corporations are guilty of this. Hence, we have allowed the use of alternative modes of communication in holding meetings and voting in absentia to encourage more meaningful stockholder participation in decision making. My dear friends, we are not only making it simpler to start a business, we are also making it easier for corporations to cease doing business. We expanded the grounds for dissolution and provided for a simplified process for both voluntary and involuntary dissolution. Both, both the vote and publication requirements were lowered and shortened on corporate governance. The second reform cluster indicates corporate transparency prescribed, inculcates, I mean, inculcates corporate transparency, prescribes stringent rules on directors and officers' accountability, and provides checks to deter corporate abuses, fraud, and graft and corrupt practices. The revised corporation code provides tougher sanctions against oppressive acts of corporations. Specifically, we, A, letter A, expanded the grounds for directors' disqualification. Second, we required corporations vested with public interest to have independent directors and compliance officers. Third, we modified the quorum requirements Fourth, we spelled out the corporate reportal requirements and expanded the corollary right of inspection and reproduction. Corporations vested with public interest are mandated to elect and appoint independent directors and compliance officers. 
This would apply to corporations covered by Section 17.2 of the Securities Regulation Code, financial institutions like banks, and other corporations engaged in businesses vested with the public interest. By the way, a lot of lobbying took place in so far as this particular provision is concerned. In any way, the name, in the name of corporate transparency on ownership, compensation, audits, and financial prospects, we spelled out documents that the corporation must make available to its stockholders. We also provided for a more meaningful access to these documents by allowing stockholders to name authorized representatives of council or council to inspect corporate documents, as it is often the case that stockholders are not the well are not well versed in corporate parlance. We have also instilled corporate civic responsibility in the new law. This is the third cluster which focuses on instilling corporate civic responsibility. We want to create not just corporate entities, but social institutions that would serve as reformative vehicles for the accumulation of capital, production of goods, and delivery of services. Under the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, or UNCA, we are obliged to prevent the use of corporations as a vehicle for committing crimes. Criminals have gotten used to hiding behind the separate personality given to corporations, while stockholders have little incentive to be vigilant because the corporation itself is not subject to criminal liability. Hence, we impose crim uh, corporate criminal liability and penalties for graft and corruption. Aside from being heavily fined, the erring corporation's registration may be revoked under the new law. The fourth reform cluster on strengthening the policy and regulatory corporate framework includes, first, the amendments to the regulatory powers of the Commission, and B, provisions on arbitration. We have aligned the Commission's powers under the Revised Corporation Code with those under the Security Regulations Code. The new law defines, reinforces, and expands the investigatory and prosecutorial and regulatory powers of the Commission. Disputes in the Commission among its stockholders arising from the implementation of the Articles of Incorporation or bylaws and other intra-corporate matters shall be referred to arbitration when so provided in the Articles of Incorporation. Of course, arbitration is not allowed if it involves a criminal offense or affects the interests of third parties. Friends, I have been working hard for good governance and institutional reforms because it is my belief that we cannot bring our country to the League of Developed Nations if there is no significant improvement in our business climate. In 2001, I authored a law that would address the abuses and excesses of the GOCCs and recruited Dean Cesar Villanueva to head that agency. And he did perform his tremendous job, a splendid job, in reforming the GOCC sector during his term. I fought for and nurtured the GOCC Governance Act from its inception to its passage because I found it deplorable that GOCCs posted a 3.46 trillion in liabilities, thus placing a huge financial burden on the national government. It is lamentable that public funds went to mismanaged and unproductive GOCCs instead of social services. It is heartwarming to note that GOCCs, that GOCCs remittance of dividends to the national government reached an all-time all -time high of 48 billion pesos in 2018. 48 billion in remittances of profits 
of the GOCCs. I dare say that passing the GOCC Governance Act has paid dividends, literally. And at this stage, let me acknowledge the invaluable assistance and guidance of the Institute of Corporate Directors, or ICD, in crafting this significant legislation. Salamat po. As Senate President in the 60th Congress, I worked hard to pass measures that would create a better business climate, improve the ease of doing business, and encourage more investments to help generate jobs. <clears throat> With the passage of the Competition Act, we finally have a con competition policy that outlaws and penalizes anti-competitive agreements, <clears throat> penalizes abuse of dominant position and anti-competitive mergers and acquisitions. Second, the amendment to the cabotage law now fosters greater com competition and lowers the cost of sea transportation. <clears throat> there has a lot more to be done in this area, and we will see what we can do to make it really open uh, for competition. <clears throat> the, uh, we also exempted foreign carriers from paying on a reciprocity basis the common carriers and value-added tax for transportation of passengers. We allowed the full entry of foreign banks over the lobby of some of our biggest domestic banks. We uh, allowed the entry of foreign banks by authorizing them to acquire and invest up to 100% of the voting stock of a domestic bank and no longer subjected to the limitation that the first 10 are uh, uh, avail of this privilege to the exclusion of the others. To strengthen the insurance industry and make it more resilient to shocks, we enacted the revised insurance code, which imposed more stringent capitalization requirements. The creation of the Department of Information and Technology was envisioned to improve the ICT systems and enhance communication services in the country. The Tax Incentive and Monitoring Transparency Act, which I authored, fosters transparency and accountability in the grant of fiscal incentives to business entities. The amendments to the Charter of the PDIC provided for the needed reforms to make, that make PDIC a more effective and efficient insurer of deposit, consistent with the international best practices. We likewise passed, during my term as Senate President, the Customs Modernization and Tariff Act, or CMTA, that introduced full automation of customs procedures and strengthened the Bureau of Customs Risk Management and Revenue and Collection Enforcement Systems. Of course, nothing in the law could prevent the smuggling of over one billion of shabu in our customs these days. But we have nothing, the law has nothing to do with that. As minority leader, my dear friends, in the current 17th Congress, I supported the enactment of the Personal Property Security Act, which simplifies and harmonizes personal property mortgage laws and financial regulations. It enhances micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, or MSMEs, access to credit by allowing the use of non-traditional collateral. Likewise, I supported the passage of the Ease of Doing Business and Efficient, Efficient Government Delivery Act, which seeks to enhance the country's competitiveness. It streamlines the procedures and, and shortens processing time for government transaction and contains an automatic clause, automatic approval clause when an application request is not acted upon within the prescribed time. I personally inserted the amendments to this law <clears throat> because of my experience in putting up an 11 billion halaor project in my home province in Iluil. It took me two years as Senate President to get the uh, free, prior, and informed consent from the <coughs> National Commission on Indigenous People. 
So I can imagine what a private person will go have to go through if I went through a Senate president through two years of difficult <coughs> task of getting the free prior informed consent. I cannot imagine how difficult it will, it will be for the private sector. So hopefully this would uh, streamline and uh, uh, enhance the uh, uh, permit issuance of licenses uh, in uh, and the processing time among among uh, government offices. Of course, we also passed the new Central Bank Act approved last year. It aligns the BSP Charter with international best practices, expands the regulatory and policy making powers of the Banco Central in the Philippines to cover non-bank financial institutions. The new law also allows the Monetary Board to regulate and exercise the power of examination over entities engaged in money service businesses. We will have what we call a lame duck session starting May 20 for nine session days. There's a number of bills, but the most significant that I would like to push, and I hope I get your support, is the amendments to the Public Service Act. The Public Service Act is a 1930 legislation which even requires a franchise to an ice plant company. Can you imagine an ice plant company being required to get a franchise? This is how outmoded this law is. Uh, we have uh, filed a bill. Uh, it has been uh, processed and heard by the Committee on Public Services. It was sponsored before we um, suspended our session for the election. When we come back on May 20, with your support, we should be able to update the Public Service Act and make our laws more attractive for foreign investment because of we will be, uh, be streamlining the provisions of the Public Service Act. But my dear friends, crafting laws is not enough. We must also commit to safeguard the reforms we have painstakingly put in place so that neither force nor personality can reverse them. To the Securities Exchange Commission with Chairman Aquino here, please do not allow the new powers given to you by the law to be used to stifle business enterprises and initiatives. These powers should be exercised to streamline the regulatory environment rather than hinder business growth. To the business sector, you may use the new law as a tool and enabler for innovation and job creation. To go, the governance advocates like the ICD, Sharefield, JRI, PCCI, MAP, Phoenix, MBC, uh, PMAP, and GGAPP. You may continue to do your share, and may you continue to do your share in improving the governance regime in the corporate world. So it is on this note that I congratulate the men and women who made this joint forum this afternoon on the revised Corporation Code feasible. You have done your share in trying to inform our business sector of this new law, and we do hope that we can continue working together to continuously improve our business climate. Thank you very much, and may I have a pleasant good afternoon to all. Shall we give the senator a very big hand for spearheading this timely, if not late, amendments to the corporation vote? There's a lot to absorb from the presentation or the keynote speech. So now we're going to have two distinguished lawyers do a deep dive, as they say in news parlance, into the salient and uh, critical revisions that have been made to the corporation code. 
Our first presenter is former Dean of the Ateneo Law School, appointed in, twin, appointed in 2004 to succeed renowned constitutionalist Father Joaquin Bernas. He is the first chairman of the, Gover of the Governance Commission for GOCCs and was instrumental in rationalizing the operations of GOCCs. He was also a recent front runner for the position of justice of the Supreme Court of the Philippines, and we hope he will all continue to be nominated. As they say, patience is a virtue. <laughs> He's currently the chairman of, of the commercial, and uh, was chairman of the commercial law department, a member of the academic council and consultants group of the Philippine Judicial Academy, the educational arm of the Philippine Supreme Court. He's a member of the Philippine Bar Association, the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, and the Philippine Institute of Certified Public Accountants. He's a fellow and trustee of the Institute of Corporate Directors and the chairman of the Corporate Governance Committee of the Management Association of the Philippines. The two presenters are going to focus on particular aspects of practically the life of a corporation. And so for the first part, uh, Dean Cesar will talk about changes in the creation, formation, organization, and dissolution of corporations under the Revised Corporation Code. So ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Attorney Cesar Villanueva. And before Cesar speaks, I wish to remind the audience that questions or presenters will be entertained during the Q&A or the panel discussion. So at which point you will be asked to introduce yourself during the Q&A and briefly ask your question and not make a speech, okay? So just a friendly reminder. So may we have Cesar, please? Thank you, Butch. Uh, Senator Derlan, thank you for the kind words, and uh, Chairman Aquino. To a great extent, many of the things that we will discuss uh, this afternoon, Francis and I, are really addressed to that now all-powerful body called the Securities and Exchange Commission. The original title uh, of the forum, when it was uh, being put up by attorney Francis Lim was changes, opportunities, and challenges. And indeed, that's what we're going to present this afternoon. All right. My discussion will basically cover three areas on the impact of the revisions of the old corporation code on the ease of doing business, corporate governance regime promotion, and effective promotion of the corporate medium for SMEs. Substantially, the discussion will be on the third one, because in effect, it is not just MSMEs that are within the revolution, so to speak. It is even big businesses because of the attempt to ease the manner by which they are incorporated. We should remember that the corporation code, although it is expressly repealed by the provision of the revised corporation code, remains the bedrock upon which all of the provisions in the revised corporation code are supposed to be understood. In other words, the whole body of doctrines and jurisprudence uh, that is still out there uh, affects basically how we interpret the changes that have been brought about by the revised corporation code. And we should understand uh, not only the changes and the additions that you may find in the, in the revised corporation code as the ones that are important, but what the corporation code deleted from the old corporation code. They also have effect on our jurisprudence. All right. So we go to the first one. Revisions of the old corporation code to promote ease of doing business in our country. A lot will be said about online registration, filing and reporting. In fact, this has been going on even before uh, the revised corporation code came into effect. Although we've had glitches. Yeah. We are all experiencing the difficulty of trying to get online with all of this, but I'm sure all of those will be fixed. 
one of the other items that is uh, touted as ease of doing business is in fact the default rule of perpetual corporate existence, which is now the default rule. It is not a choice uh, if you miss providing for that in the Articles of Incorporation. With an option to either two things, to retain for those that are already existing, or to adopt for those that are yet to be organized under the RCC. You notice that the, the ability to retain the indicated corporate terms for existing corporation is done simply by a majority vote of the stockholders or the members. Simple process. And the appraisal right of the uh, dissenting stockholders is fully recognized. So, the appraisal right is usually granted under the revised corporation code for extension or shortening. Retention is one of the uh, items where appraisal right can be fixed. <coughs> the other one that we, we looked at is a provision that allows a revival of the corporation with expired terms. I'm sorry, that should be corporations with expired terms. No. That's a simple provision that you find in, in the revised corporation code. Actually, the challenges that are brought before practitioners and primarily before the SEC is what are the prescribed internal corporate procedures to be adopted by which to trigger an application for revival with the SEC? Many things are unanswered by that short provision in the, the revised corporation code. Is it going to be done merely by majority vote of the stockholders because it is found in the same section where extension or retention is found? Or does it require two-thirds of the outstanding capital stock? Does it require a vote by a majority of the board? Nothing is implied there, and that is within the power of the SEC to do. The other question is, are stockholders of non-voting shares allowed to vote at said meeting? Because the provisions of what is now continues to be Section 6 of the Revised Corporation Code allows eight instances when even non-voting stockholders are allowed to vote. Revival is not one of them. And, and that's a key point that you have to understand. Will the dissenting stockholders to be, be allowed to exercise the right of appraisal? That's a good question because revival is not equivalent to extension. It is true that under the terms of the corporation code, revised corporation code, an appraisal right is triggered by an amendment of the Articles of Incorporation for either the extension or shortening of corporate life. But the revival is not, is not an extension simply because a revival presumes that the corporation is now dissolved and has undergone what you call liquidation process. And it is within an area of corporate existence where, number one, the expiration of the corporate term effectively makes the otherwise input rights of stockholders to proportionately share in the net assets of the corporation, net assets means after payment of all liabilities, to receive a proportional share. In other words, that is vested. And if that is vested, will a majority vote or a two-thirds vote of the outstanding capital stock bind the dissenting stockholders? If they say, my right to share in the net assets is already vested. I don't want to be part of a revived corporation. They certainly, under property law, have that right because they cannot be bound anymore. The expiration of the corporate term has effectively placed the corporation into dissolution and liquidation stages, has put the trust fund doctrine in effect that now it is the, stock, it is the creditors who have a right to the corporate assets. And therefore, can a majority affirmative vote or a two-thirds affirmative vote by the stockholders to revive what has already been an expired or a dissolved corporation bind the creditors from being able to proceed? Those are the questions that have to be answered. And it's not as if the, the, those, the dissenting, the dissenting stockholders, have a right to an appraisal because that is not provided for right now by the revised corporation code, unlike in the case of retention. 
So that's a whole that's a whole provision that will now grant the SEC an opportunity to provide for a whole set uh, of being able to uh, apply revival issues. And these are the things that the SEC has to determine. How do you overcome the vested rights of stockholders and creditors to a liquidation of corporate affairs? My own thinking is that the revival, although it is found in the retention provision of the RCC, should be applied prospectively. In other words, although the retention is meant to cover and encompass all corporations, and all corporations right, have a definite term, the revival is, should answer only uh, those corporations which, whose terms have expired because they retained and they wish to be revived. I do not think that this can be what we call an interim measure. Okay, those are the challenges addressed to practitioners and to the SEC. We'll continue with ease of doing business. More manageable rules on corporate names, which even allows the SEC to issue orders and in itself has the power to prevent uh, the continued use of uh, a corporate name uh, from, from signages and advertisements, very powerful. The deletion of the requirement on capitalization should be in lawful currency. That's one of the things that you find. Under the old corporation code, it used to be that the authorized capital stock had to be in local currencies of the Philippines. That has been deleted. That means that it authorizes the SEC, if it wants to, in accordance with our uh, uh, accounting principles, to allow corporations, especially domestic corporations that are branch that are subsidiaries of foreign corporation, to express them in foreign currencies. Although when you look at Article 14, Article 14 on the forms, it uses the pesos, but that's just the form, right? It, it means you have to quote something. So that's that's one area that is fascinating. It will it it allows the ease of investments of foreign corporations into our country. And then no more minimum capital, but it also retained the rule on no maximum capital. Uh, all right, and, and, and the reason for that, of course, is the one-person corporation is meant to do that, right? In line with that, the RCC now has removed, except in increase in authorized capital stock, the 25, 25%, 25%, 25% subscription paid up ease of doing business. But I was, as I was talking this afternoon with the Chairman Aquino, how do you do that? It says, would you allow, would we now allow corporations to incorporate where it's a, a one million peso authorized capital stock, one million peso subscription, one peso paid up, right? Actually what it does is to remove in statutory language this framework and actually grants to the commission the ability to determine. In other words, the commission is no longer bound by a strict 25 25% 20, 25%, 25% rule, and it is up to the commission to determine when it comes to this type of corporation, these are the rules. When it comes to a one-person corporation, all fully paid. It just grants more power and flexibility to the corporation, to the commission, instead of putting it into this straight jacket. Ease of doing business makes the SEC more powerful and an effective regulatory agency. Finally, it was uh, Attorney Alu who said, they have, there was found in the draft bill a statutory rendition of the control test of corporate nationality, basically in the same language as you found now, as you will find now in SEC memo circular number eight. I am so glad that this was not adopted in the revised corporation code. So glad. Because if it were adopted, then you would have put into statutory state jacket the nationality test under SEC memorandum circular number eight. Is that good or bad? It's utterly bad. Because for all of, for those who are students of corporation law, we recall, upon close reading of Roy III versus Chairman Herbosa, that the Supreme Court, in fact, insinuated that 
the real test, nationality test, on vote is on voting stock. But that, because the SEC is the regulatory agency that handles and oversees corporation, its requirement that it should not only be on voting stock, but the entire outstanding capital stock, is valid. Clearly, a close reading of Roy III versus Herbosa indicates that it is quite possible for the SEC, in the exercise of its regulatory powers, to actually just say, and this is to invite foreign investors to come in, to say that the test of nationality is only on the voting shares. And you have preferred shares that are non-voting that can be 90% and only the voting shares 10%. It really doesn't matter because all of the powers would still be in the voting shares who will elect the board of directors. So happy that that didn't work. Right. And then the express power to enter into partnerships and joint ventures. Wonderful, because we've had so many dealings on whether a corporation, it's an ancient, ancient uh, corporate law principle that says that a manufactured entity cannot be part of another manufactured entity. And by putting this, it has put into uh, statutory language the fact that it is now common law that corporations can enter into partnerships and joint venture. But the real game changer is the provision on a special classification of one person corporation, which I will take later on. All right, we go to the second item. Statutory fact paradigm shift in corporate governance principle. And I preface it with the word statutory, word statutory because the paradigm shift had happened a long while ago. Now, the paradigm shift in corporate governance principle happened when the SEC, in the exercise of its quasi-legislative power, promulgated and enacted a code of corporate governance for GEOs, for uh, corporations, which ushered into play what we call the stakeholders theory, or what the good senator has said, corporate civic responsibility. So, the good thing about it is that the RCC has now put into statutory language these principles of corporate governance so that they cannot be moved low. Uh, our experience with uh, uh, in the SEC is what they came out with the Code of Corporate Governance, ushered in stakeholders theory, and, and then issued a revised one that pulled it all back, and then when Chairman Herbosa came in, she put it back. Today, it becomes unalterable, because they are now expressed in a statutory language under the RCC. The most important one would therefore be the express classifications of corporations vested with public interest. That ushers in, basically, the stakeholders theory that the obligations of board of directors is not just to the stockholders or investors under the Securities Regulation Code, but to all uh, persons and entities and the community who are affected by the business of a corporation which are, all, which are called corporations vested with public interest. And RCC has gone away in order to do this, to enumerate the most important ones. It reiterated what you, are, what you already find in the Securities Regulation Code, right? Whose securities are registered with the SEC, listed companies in the stock exchange, and public companies. The question that we often ask is, why do you need to do this again? When the corporations vested in public interest as a classification is meant to usher in the independent director system, because those are already covered by, S by the Securities Regulation Commission regulation code. Then we have banks and quasi-banks, loans and savings association, and all of those limits itself to corporations engaged in money service businesses, pre-need trust insurance companies, and other financial intermediaries. If you look at the first two categories, they basically encompass what we call what is vested in public interest as those that are involved in financial intermediaries. And therefore, what you get is that the independent directors are there to protect what we call not just the stockholders, but those who have invested in the securities of the companies, as well as those who have, who, who have 
uh, who, as well as corporations that are handling what we call public money, right? And it's all what we call financial related. When, when as we know, best of the public interest goes beyond financial involvement. One query that we have is, when it comes even to publicly held companies, which are already covered by the SRC, the independent director requirement is 20%, which is different from the at least two independent directors or at least 20% of the entire board, whichever is lower, provided for under the SRC. In effect, because the corp revised corporation code is the latter law, it has now preempted these requirements under the SRC and says that there's only one test. It's 20% of the entire board. That means that if you have a board of a five-man board, you will have less than two, right? 10 is the last number unless you, you move up. And, and yet, if you look at the bills that were being sent there, the proposal was to, in, big, in fact, be higher than the SRC, three or 30%, whichever was higher. And is this a move back? My answer is it's not. It is meant to satisfy two forces. One force that said, why do we have independent directors? And another force that says, we should have more independent directors. This is what I call a temporary measure. It seems to look good neutral and yet if you look at the powers of the sec below one of the powers that's granted to sec is the power to determine the size of independent directors of corporations and classification you don't look at this you look at chairman aquino <laughs> because he can now by legislation you know the problem we had before this was that even if uh, the SEC wanted to increase the independent directors higher than 20%, it couldn't do so because the SRC said that this was the number. It could only invite publicly held corporations to increase. But with this, as the boogeyman, the SEC can, say, can now say if it wants to, by statutory language, 30%, 50%. Now, that runs a shiver in, the, in the, the backs of many, but that's the real change. The other one is uh, corporations. The third type are corporations engaged in businesses vested with public interest, similar to the above, above, which seems to indicate that it's only financial intermediaries and investors. As determined by the SEC, Taking into account relevant factors which are germane to the objective and purpose of requiring the election of an independent director, such as the extent of minority ownership, type of financial products, and then this is what it says, public interest involved in the nature of business operations and other analogous factors. SEC has to tell us, therefore, on whether similar to the above found in the body of the law, is bounded also by other, other analogous factors because this is where public interest in the nature of the business comes in as the all powerful power of the SEC to include therein those that have nothing to do with finance, public utilities, common carriers, private public hospitals which are so big. And for, fortunately, there's enough in the RCC to say that the SEC has a right to determine the number of independent directors and in what areas it can be applied. And just call it corporations vested with public interest. It's not as if the paradigm shift started only with the SEC. You know that common carriers is a statutory provision that puts into a, a one that is vested with public interest, the extraordinary diligence that is required from the board, from the corporation itself. And as you know, when a company, a corporation or a business is imposed by law 
whether statutorily or by jurisprudence, with the fiduciary obligation to exercise extraordinary diligence, then all that the public has to do when it suffers a fault is to say, I have suffered a fault under. And the presumption is the company is at fault. And this has applied in many other areas, like the banking industry. Even before the general banking law of 2000 provided that banks must exercise the utmost diligence, the Supreme Court itself has already said that because banking industry takes in, is vested in public interest, then banks and their officers are mandated to exercise extraordinary diligence. And in fact, did one thing that is quite revolutionary. It said that banks have a fiduciary duty. They have a fiduciary duty not only to their stockholders, but to the depositors, to those who, with whom they do business. And as many practitioners would know, in the Professional Services Inc. versus Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court, based on two decisions and bank, and one decision uh, on a second motion for reconsideration, uh, I'm sorry, two, de two decisions by division, and an end bank decision of the Supreme Court has said that when hospitals, even though they're private ones, in this case, Medical City, when hospitals or any business opens its door to the public and invites them to cater to its business, like shopping malls, then, even if it's not a public company, they have what we call a corporate social responsibility to the persons who use their premises. Therefore, it is firmly. In other words, the stakeholders' theory on corporations vested with public interest has now both a statutory basis and a jurisprudential basis. Okay, moving on. These are the obligations of corporations vested with public interest in order to make them more accountable, aside from at least 20% uh, independent directors of the entire board. It granted the SEC tremendous powers, as will be discussed by Attorney Lim, to remove disqualified directors and imposing sanctions on board who failed to remove such directors. Okay, and we used to search. When, when I was in International Forum, they wanted to search our corporation code on any statutory meaning that would say that directors and officers owe fiduciary duties not only to the corporation, not only to the stockholders, but including other stakeholders. We couldn't find any, right? Today, we have under Section 23 that item. It says, the directors or trustees elected shall perform their duties. Remember, duties are open-ended. They're, they're unlike obligations which are within the four corners of a contract. Duties are open-ended. It covers any relationship just as the duties of a husband to the wife would be. As prescribed by law, right? Rules of corporate governance. And all the rules of corporate governance are not meant to strengthen the fiduciary duties only of the board to the stockholders, but to all stakeholders, to the environment, to the community, and to the country. This has now been adopted. In other words, it can be said, as has been said in the cases of the Supreme Court, that by statutory impulse, board of directors, when they sit in the exercise of the judgment, have a fiduciary duties even to creditors, even to suppliers, even to their communities. That's a great paradigm shift. And then there's a formal, formal recognition of the corporate governance principle that even as management handles the day-to-day -day affairs of the corporation, it remains accountable to the board of directors in whom all corporate powers and all corporate properties and all corporate business have been directly vested by law through that provision in section, now section 24 of the RCC. If you notice, the word management has never found any uh, expression in the corporation code, not even in the old corporation law. Today, that has found expression. And it says the officer shall manage the corporation and form such duties as may be provided for in the bylaws and as resolved by the board of directors. In other words, corporate officers, even as they owe fiduciary duties to the corporation, to the stockholders, and to the other stakeholders, they are still what they call sub-agents of the board. What does that mean? In the loan agency, a board, when an agent is authorized to appoint a sub-agent, 
that agent, the board of directors is an agent, becomes solidarity liable with the sub-agent. That's the principle that is meant to be covered here. And then the final item, of course, is that the RCC now recognizes that even as stock corporations may have enterprise that would qualify as vested with public interest and provides for independent trustees. How that will work out, again, is in the all-powerful hands of Chairman Aquino. <laughs> All right. Now I go to the substance of uh, what? Uh, just, just 10 minutes. All right. Now we go to the all power for change, uh, and I will not go through it very, uh, very detailed. What is the game changer that the corporation, the Vice Corporation Code has done? It has no minimum number of corporators. Incorporators no longer limited to natural persons. Deletion of the requirement of majority of incorporators must be resident in the Philippines. With an allowance that says a person, partnership, association, or a corporation, either alone or together with others, may organize a corporation. And yet it has what we call a contradictory provision at the end. It says, although it allows a partnership or association or corporation, thank you, you to singly organize a corporation, it says a corporation with a single stockholder is considered a one-person corporation. And if you go to the provision on chapter three on one-person corporation, partnerships, associations, or corporations cannot become single stockholders. So what does that mean? Definitely there is an authorization for corporations partnerships and associations to singly form a corporation as incorporator. And yet, there is a prohibition. And it is what the SEC will now develop. Is this a policy distinction that says that a corporation that is formed by a single natural being is a single one-person corporation governed by Chapter 3, but all the rest are not? That's a question that the Commission will have to work on and changes in the requirements and and to be frank about it I'll, i was asked by boots to cut it short <laughs> right oh no no <laughs> <laughs> to be frank about it the real revolution is not here as all practitioners know corporations on their own have always been able to become the main stockholders by not being incorporators but by meaning being what they called incorporating shareholders and they use five persons in order to be the incorporators they have always been able to do that and the only thing that changed is this this is powerful because of this because in order to promote the one person corporation they removed that a minimum five natural persons but they also remove they was they <laughs> they also remove the minimum number of directors and peg the 15%. If you come to think of it, that's quite a revolution. It's a game changer for all corporate practitioners and all of those who have a lot of money. <laughs> really, although this was all being promoted to do the one-person corporation, MSMEs, this is more important for those who, which, uh, persons who have a lot of money. And as I was explain very quickly, and deletion of the requirement that the majority of incorporators must be resident, but only natural persons to qualify. In other words, although the liberal incorporators provision has liberalized it from natural persons to include juridical persons, the board of directors is still mandated to be only natural persons. Uh, one, one of the indications, of course, and this has always been known, uh, that it has to be natural persons. One of the items is that they cannot attend meetings by proxy or representation. We all know that, right? Okay, so this is the only limitation, right? So, therefore, it all boils down to what the SEC thinks the revised corporation code meant to do with the one-person corporation. And it's all the determination of what that means. Is the one-person corporation meant to cover an absolute rule that only natural persons can go in it? 
Or is it meant to say the one person corporation and the chapter 3, title 13, lucky 13, is meant to cover a situation where single uh, natural person wants to do, wants to incorporate. You will notice, it says, a, per, a one person corporation is a corporation with a single stockholder who must be a natural person or a trust or an estate. I think what, what the law means, not a trust because it has no authority, capacity to act, right? <laughs> it's, it's a trustee who will incorporate the trust properties or it is an administrator, executor, guardian, conservator, custodian who will incorporate as him being the sole stockholder an estate of a ward and things like that. Okay, a natural person in the positive may organize an OPC for purposes of exercising a profession when authorized by special law. And it says, if you come to think of it, try to consider what is a one-person corporation under th th chapter three. It is the equivalent of what we call the sole corporation for religious corporation meant to administer uh, the mundane properties of a church, but that person is really a trustee, the archbishop. He manages it not for his own, he manages for his flock in accordance with the articles given, right? So, if the closed corporation reflects, the, it is also, it reflects what we call, if the closed corporation is the, is the embodiment of what we call incorporated partnership, then the OPC reflects the incorporation of a sole proprietorship. It, it does the, that makes sense. All right. Okay, those are not qualified to. Can a sole proprietorship vested with public interest that is not covered by any of those not be listed, can it be listed, can it be incorporated as an OPC? There are certain financial intermediaries that can be undertaken by a sole proprietor, right? Can it now be? Because the comparison would be what a closed corporation provision says. Any corporation may be incorporated as a closed corporation, except mining or oil companies, stock exchanges, banks, insurance companies, public utilities, educator, educational institutions, and corporations declared to be vested with public interest. In other words, if you look at the RCC and says that a closed corporation, which is, a, which is basically an incorporated partnership, does not have the authority to organize, uh, to, to engage in corporations vested with public interest, then the more a one-person corporation should not be allowed, right? And the reason for that is clear. Vested with public interest requires independent directors to represent the other stakeholders, which you cannot do in a closed corporation, which is impossible in a one-person corporation. So that's one of the limitations that will be clarified to us by the SEC. All right. An OPC shall not require to have a minimum authorized capital stock. And the question that has been asked, if it was meant to be only for MSMCs, would it not have been more prudent to have allowed, uh, to have imposed a minimum capital, uh, a maximum capital stock so that it can only be used basically by sole proprietors who are engaged in MSMEs? In other words, we have a classification of what are the categories of MSMEs. That would have been good. Then it's limited solely. But because there is no limitation, it means it is open even to rich people. It's open to corporations, if you want to think about it. And even then, and I will, okay, here's the one thing why one-person corporations are not attractive to sole proprietor. It says, the liability of the single stockholder. If you look at it, there are three rules. Single stockholders claiming to be limited, claiming limited liability, he is the one who has the burden of affirmatively showing that the corporation was adequately financed. That burden is on him. Usually, it is on the side of him who claims fraud, 
financial fraud. It says, where the single stockholder cannot prove that the property of the OPC is independent of the single stockholder's separate, not invested property, he shall be solidarily liable. It is, the burden of proof is on his side. I'll finish very quickly. This is tremendous. For why is it that we are encouraging SMEs to come into a corporate setting, right? Because we're trying to ease the manner by which they can become corporations, removing minimum capital stock, removing minimum, but also to be able to take hold of what we call limited liability. And this is opposite limited liability. In fact, the moment a corporation, the only time where limited liability is important is when a corporation is under financial distress. And the moment a, a, a one-person corporation is under financial distress, then automatically, it is not adequately financed. Automatically, by provision of law, he becomes, the presumption is, he is solidarily liable. Right? That is a strong burden placed upon small entrepreneurs who are not even savvy when it comes to this. They need good lawyers. And that makes it expensive. <laughs> the principles of piercing the corporate veil applies with equal force to an OPC with other corporations. It is not true. Uh, it, it, it's not because of this. Because if you ask yourself, what is the test when an OPC is adequately financed? Certainly when it is balance sheet insolvent or civil code insolvent, meaning it cannot pay its obligations if they regularly fall due, then it is not adequately financed and therefore, automatically, unless you can prove otherwise, how do you prove that? That the, the sole stockholder is liable. In fact, what this graph will show to you is that because of the removal of the minimum five, then the closed corporation becomes a better deal on the following grounds. First of all, husbands do not incorporate solely, otherwise they're in great trouble. <laughs> not in this country. We always do it conjugally, right? And because of the removal of the five, minimum five, closed corporation allows the husband and the wife to form a closed corporation. And it is really close. In other words, it's only limited to, that's right, literally, morally, and figuratively, right? A second, of course, is that, what is, it, what is the advantage that the one-person corporation gives? It means you can be informal. You don't need a board, you can just write. That's already offered by the closed corporation. Husband and the wife can do without a board in their articles of incorporation and just run it the way they want to run it with the stockholders. That's already available. Now it has become more available because they removed the minimum five. Right. And, and theoretically, if a husband cannot live with a wife, or the, more often than not, the, the wife cannot live with the husband, cannot do business with the husband, he can always form a closed corporation by following the provisions of the law. That you find this in the board of directors, and you say it is limited to five, and then only the husband subscribes. It is not a close, it is not a one-person corporation because just the husband, uh, and he rules without the board. Same thing. You have that ease in a closed corporation as you would have. And the other thing, of course, is that you don't have what the, 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 the Yuri One Person Corporation has. It is this. Everything that you want in a, in a one person corporation, you can find in a closed corporation, except the presumption of unlimited liability. Because a closed corporation is governed exactly the same way as a regular corporation is. In other words, those are separate juridical personality and upholding of the limited liability rule is the general rule. Piercing the veil of corporate fiction is considered only what we call an equitable measure. And being an equitable measure, you cannot invoke it unless you prove the fraud, unless the other person proves the fraud. All right, and the fact alone, it says, the fact alone that a stockholder has control of the equity 
does not warrant the application of the piercing doctrine. So, what does that mean? It's a big world for us that has been open wide, only because they wanted to promote the one-person corporation, which is great, but it has liberalized the whole area. And therefore, when Chairman came in, he, he said he was a little bit uh, uh, filled with pressure. Actually, Mr. Chairman Aquino, we are the ones who are who feel pressured because in your hands are now a very is a very powerful agency, all powerful. And I end with a, with a saying that <laughs> Spider-Man, because you have been granted such vast, awesome powers, Mr. Chairman, then it is expected that you will exercise them with great responsibility. Thank you. <laughs> Assessor. My key takeaways from that discussion was good changes, many questions, more work for lawyers, more work for the SEC, but finally choose the right husband so you can form your own conjugal corporation. <laughs> but anyway, to go now to the second presenter. Uh, our next presenter was closely involved in the enactment of several Philippine laws, such as the fin Financial Rehabilitation and Invol Ins Insolvency Act, the Credit Investment System Act, the Real Estate Investment Trust Act, the Personal Equity Retirement Account, and the Philippine Competition Act. He was also involved in the formulation of several Philippine procedural ro rules, such as the interim rules on intercorporate controversies, Rules on electronic evidence, rules on notarial practice, rules on DNA evidence, financial rehabilitation, rules of procedure, and the financial liquidation and suspension of payment rules of procedure. He is incumbent president of the Sh of Sharefield, a vice president of MAP, and chairman of the MAP National Compet Competitiveness Committee, chairman of the Judicial System Working Group of the National Competitiveness Council a trustee of the CIBI Foundation, Inc., Phoenix Research and Development Foundation, Inc., and the Judicial Reform In Initiative, and a fellow of the Institute of Corporate Directors. So now to appraise us on the changes in management and administration of corporations under the RCC, please welcome Attorney Francis Lee. Uh, thank you very much, Butch. Uh, thank you for sparing us with your afternoon. I know it's Tuesday, a very busy afternoon, but I think uh, with the uh, speech alone of Senator Delon and Dean Villanueva, his presentation, I think, it's worth the afternoon. Just discount me. <laughs> anyway, uh, Senator Delon um, gives his apologies. He, uh, he was called to the Senate for a press conference. He would have, he would have uh, uh, liked to stay for the open forum, but unfortunately, uh, his uh, colleagues in the Senate uh, suddenly called him. I understand from the staff that uh, Dean Villanueva's and my presentation were uploaded, uh, were sent to you by email. Am I right? No? Hmm? Uh, actually, I have two parts. First, uh, I did a point-by-point, side-by-side comparison of the provisions that were affected by the amendments. And part two, uh, the presentation was meant to deal with uh, the challenges, but I added opportunities uh, of uh, brought about by the new corporation code. But I'd like to skip the first one in the interest of time, because we're running out of time, and Chairman Aquino has to catch a flight no, uh, for Davao. So, what's this? Is track here? Alojado? So, you, just, you can just um, uh, get hold of my presentation and the side by side comparisons are there. But as I said, I'd like to go to the practical aspect of the revision of the revised. Um, or corporation code.
Can somebody help me, technical? Okay, part two. Okay, as Dean Villanueva and Senator Deloy explained, corporations have now automatic um, uh, perpetual existence. And this applies not only to corporations that are to be formed under the code, but also to existing corporations. In fact, all existing corporations shall have automatic um, uh, existence. No? But the question is, and uh, this is something practical, what if before the RCC came into effect, the stockholders have already decided to end the life of the corporation? <coughs> they held stockholders meeting, filed the amendment of articles to shorten the life of the corporation, and the SEC has already approved the shortening, for example, on December 31, 2018. In the meanwhile, the new the revised corporation code or RCC came into effect and the RCC expressly provides that existing corporations will have, will continue to exist in perpetuity. So for the practitioner and for the corporation involved, would that mean that you have to call a stockholders meeting again to decide to end, to end for the second time, the corporate life of your corporation. There is now a case that is uh, an issue. So because under the new uh, revised corporation code, you have to uh, get the majority of the standing capital stock to manifest to the SEC that you are indeed ending your life. But in this particular case, before the effectivity of the RCC, the stockholders and in fact the SEC has already approved the ending of the corporate life, for example, in the December 2018. So that's a challenge that that particular corporation and lawyers advising that particular corporation has have to uh, wrestle with. There is a pro-life provision. No? Corporation with an expired term may apply for revival with the SEC. This is important because we all know that a lot of corporations have expired terms. In fact, I'm involved in at least two corporations. One, okay, of course you know that if the corporation goes into liquidation, distributes its assets and settles liabilities, they're taxed. And sometimes many of, many of those corporations have huge assets that would call into play the taxation on liquidating dividends. But with this, that particular company, I, in fact, there's another corporation, uh, the, the corporate life has expired. It's now undergoing liquidation proceedings before a regional trial court. And the members, this is a, uh, um, the members, I think about 6,000, want to revive the corporation. If the corporation code were not amended to provide for revival of corporation, that particular company, a public interest company, okay, would have to sell its assets and pay the government dividends and nothing will be left with the members or the shareholders. With this particular provision and revival, they can now petition Chairman Aquino to revive the corporation even if it is undergoing liquidation proceedings with the courts of law. But I think that's something that the SEC has to deal with in the implementing rules and regulations of this new law. Independent directors, I think Dean Villanueva has already discussed this. But for, for practical purposes, for public interest corporations, the notice of the meeting must contain the requirements and procedure for nomination and election. So additional work for our corporation that are mandated by law to have independent directors. Okay? Number of directors, okay, as again said, the minimum number of directors has been removed. But if you are a corporation that is subject to special rules, like publicly listed companies, you have to maintain the number of directors that are required by those special rules. For example, in the SEC, 
and the PSE required that publicly listed companies should have at least a minimum number of directors. I think if you follow this, your company stands to be the least the risk. It stands the risk of being delisted by the Philippine Stock Exchange. So for, for, for publicly listed companies, don't just rely on this. You have to check special laws or special rules that govern your company. Another one, no residence requirement that was said. This is pro-business in the sense that in practice, many foreign investors want representation in the board. Understandably so because they invest their own money. But because of the old rule that the majority of the board must be Filipino citizens, that served as a disincentive for foreign investments. Anti-perpetration provision. I do recall, I don't know if any one of you was involved in the famous Valle Verde case, where the board of directors was elected, I think, in 1996. And for one reason or another, there were no stockholders or members meeting held in 1997, 1998, 1999, 2000, and 2001. Obviously, because the sitting incumbent directors wanted to perpetrate themselves in power. So all that they did was to prevent a quorum so that their successors could not be elected by the opposing camp. That is now gone under the revised corporation code because the code, as uh, Dean says have said, has empowered, has given vast powers to the SEC to summarily to call a stockholders meeting to call and order the holding of that meeting where it is unjustifiably uh, not held. You know, naman, we uh, practitioners have all those dirty tricks, but I think with this new provision of the revised corporation court, gone will be those days. All that we tell our clients who are holding majority of the stock don't appeal. You prevent the, if you prevent a quorum, and you will stay in power. I think this is a pro-governance measure. Thank you to the ICD for trying to uh, remedy this situation. Emergency director. We all know that sometimes a vacancy prevents a quorum. In other words, in, in for, for example, in a, direct, in a company with seven directors, it may happen that only three are uh, only three remain, uh, uh, directors remain, and therefore three cannot be a quorum, and therefore no corporate business can be conducted by the company. The new corporation code now uh, says that when vacancy prevents remaining directors or trustees from constituting a quorum, and an emer emergency action is required to prevent grave, substantial, and irreparable loss or damage to the corporation, vacancy may be temporarily filled from among officers by the unanimous vote of remaining directors and trustees. In other words, those three out of seven directors remaining can elect a temporary director. But the question is, and this is a challenge, what does irreparable loss mean? Because in law, um, anything that can be measured by money cannot qualify as irreparable loss. So would, that, would the SEC now consider irreparable loss as defined by the Supreme Court for uh, injunction as the same for purposes of this law? That, is, that remains to be seen in the implementing rules and regulations of the SEC. Next, compensation or per diems of directors and trustees. This is quite a challenge for directors. Okay? The new code now says that directors cannot participate in the determination of their compensation or per diems. Okay, now we know that under the current setup, there is a remuneration committee, even for publicly listed companies. The remuneration committee recommends to the board, and the board acts on the recommendation of the remuneration committee. That cannot be done now. The remuneration committee that determines increase in per diems cannot be composed of even one or two directors, much less should that increase in per diems be approved by the board because of the new cor uh, the revised corporation code. So what does this mean to the company? The company has to set up a system for compensation independent from the board. 
Otherwise, the incumbent directors will get stuck with their present level of per diems and compensation. On how to do it, I think it, the SEC will leave it to corporations, but I think this is a challenge for management of company. And this applies, I think, to companies, uh, to, to companies, whether or not it's a public interest company or private companies. Disclosure of compensation. Time and again, publicly listed companies refuse to disclose the individual remuneration or compensation by directors for so-called security reasons. Okay, so in aggregate nila, but I think pursuant to good corporate governance, there is now an express provision in the revised corporation code where it says that corporations vested with public interest must annual report to the SEC the total compensation of each director or trustee. So, for those companies, that may be a challenge because many of the independent directors don't want their compensation to be disclosed, perhaps for fear for, for, for their wife. <laughs> I'm not one of them, though. Okay, next, compliance officer, I think, Corporations publicly invested with public interest are now required to have a compliance officer, although I think under the code, the corporate secretary can be that compliance officer. But there is a danger there because I've seen instances where corporate secretary or even vice presidents for finance have compliance officers, so they made compliance secondary to their primary role. And there is a risk there. You can get penalized by your regulators, including by the Philippine Stock Exchange. Related party transactions. Okay? Self-dealing contracts was, uh, were expanded to include not only directors or trustees and officers, but also their spouses and relatives within the firm's civil degree of consanguinity or affinity. Okay. How, for example, will you determine the first cousin of your wife or your, uh, the, uh, the relatives of your first cousins? Okay. That may pose a practical problem for companies. Okay. Then there is this provision, and this applies to um, material contracts between these people, the expanded definition of uh, of uh, the, uh, the, the prohibited persons and the corporation vested with public interest must be approved by at least two-thirds of the entire membership of the board with at least a majority of the independent directors voting to approve that transaction. Again, corporations must review their compliance system for such contracts. I'm a member, I think, uh, HUY and I are member of, uh, members of an RPT, Related Party Transactions of a publicly listed company, now delisted, but it's still a public company, and I think we have to review our compliance system to make sure that we follow this procedure. Appraisal for performance. Corporations must submit annually such reports and standards, standards and criteria used to assess, assess each director or trustee to the SEC. I just came from a board meeting, and before the board meeting, I was asked to rate myself because of this. Okay? It's self-rating because under the revised co corporation code, that out the, the company in which I'm serving as an independent director is now required to do uh, an individual performance uh, rating of my performance. Electronic notification, I think that was uh, said, electronic notification to shareholders is now available, but in only when the bylaws provide it. So you may want to check your bylaws if the system is already in place. If not, you have to decide whether you can uh, send um, electronic notification. But I think for uh, public interest companies, that is required. Voting by remote communication or absentia. You have read about this in the papers. But to allow teleconferencing or video conferencing in meetings of stockholders and members, 
the bylaws must be amended. That is our analysis of the code. But for public, uh, but for public interest company, even if there's no bylaw provision, this is mandatory for them. Again, for example, in the ease of doing business report by the World Bank, IFC, the World Economic Forum Competitiveness Survey, they always ask this question. Do you allow shareholders to vote by mail? Okay? In other words, is if I'm a foreign shareholder or if I'm a shareholder from the South, I can now vote, just mail to the company my vote on the items of the agenda. So what does that mean for companies? They must put up a system to enable their shareholders to allow not only by by video conferencing, but by mail. I have to mail, I can mail my vote, and the company is obliged to respect that vote which I mailed. I just was asking Attorney Dorotanir if this also contemplates mail, ordinary mail, registered mail. He said that is the essence of the voting in absentia. This is a pro-governance um, code, and I think uh, it will do well in um, for organizations like Sherfield. By the way, uh, many of these provisions we participated from the minority shareholders protection point of view. Okay, uh, before I leave the independent directors, before I forget, uh, Dean Villanueva said that the SEC and I was talking with uh, Chair Emil while uh, Dean Villanueva was making his presentation. Under the new code, the SEC has the power to prescribe the qualifications, disqualifications, voting requirements, term and term limits of independent directors. Why did we put that? For example, what we, have, we would have wanted in Sherfield is that independent directors must be voted by a majority of the outstanding capital stock and minority and majority of the minority shareholders. Because our experience is that independent directors are chosen by controlling shareholders. And once they vote against controlling shareholders, that all, that, that, that's not that, but the, I think they lose their seat the next year, okay? That's, that happens, okay? This morning, I said, uh, I said in front of the controlling shareholder, shareholder, I cannot agree to that in the committee meeting. It's good that that controlling shareholder is well-meaning, respected my view, I cannot vote on that. And I was joined by other independent, but nagihintayan kami. I think that, that, that happens on the ground. Now, Note that the SEC has the power to prescribe the duration of term limit of the independent. What I had in mind was that, and I hope Chair Aquino will listen to this, why not make by regulation the term of independent directors three years? Okay? But not carefully chosen. But at least my security of tenure. Okay? I think that is a possibility. That's why we had that power clause empowering the SEC to do it. Of course, subject to the nine-year rule. Waiver of notices, okay. Well, this is under the old law, mere attendance is a waiver of uh, the defect in notice. But now, the new uh, revised corporation code makes, gives an exception. When attendance is for the purpose of objecting because the meeting was not lawfully called or convened. Time and again, I've represented shareholders in shareholders' meeting. And I said, Your, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think this meeting is not lawfully convened because there are defects in notice. It was not sent, uh, well, 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 did not comply with the minimum number of days and so on and so forth. And he said, the mere fact that you are attending is already a waiver of that, um, what they call, of that objection. Now, 
Even if I attend, if I raise that objection, that is not considered waiver under the RCC. Okay? Notice for stockholders meeting, more detailed notice is now required. For example, the notice must not only contain the agenda, it must also attach the proxy form, it must also state the requirements and procedure to be followed if voting is through remote communication or in absentia, or when the meeting is for the election of directors, trustees, the requirements and procedure for nomination and election of directors. So for corporate secretaries of companies, you have to take note of this because we don't now well, we don't we cannot now follow the usual notice that we have been following. Minimum requirements for minutes of meeting, even minutes of meeting, the contents have been expanded to include, for example, description of voting and tabulation procedures, description of opportunity given to stakeholders or members to ask questions, and the record of questions asked and answers given. Matters discussed and resolutions, record of voting results for each agenda. I don't know what that means. Will the SEC require that there should be a headcount for each item of the agenda? Or is it enough to say a majority of the quorum or of the standing capital stock uh, uh, has approved this? I really don't know, and it remains to be seen how the SEC will deal with this. But as Senator Deloney said, let this not be an impediment for ease of doing business, okay? Require the person during the meeting, okay? Reports to shareholders are now more detailed. Information on current stockholders, members, and their voting rights, okay? So if we have difference as a stockholders holding different class of shares, the report uh, to the SEC must contain that. And this is detailed, descriptive, balanced, and comprehensible assessment of the corporation's performance. What does this mean? Detailed, descriptive, balanced, and comprehensible assessment of. So those are preparing annual reports. Take note of this. Or information statement. Take note of this. Okay? Explanation of the dividend policy and the fact of payment or reason of non-payment. Okay? Director or trustee attendance report in board meetings. That is now, uh, should be contained. Although I know that many of the companies are already doing that. Appraisal report and performance report for the board. And this is the compensation report for each individual director or um, the trustee and disclosures on self-dealings and related party transactions. Okay, you know, um, I was kidding one of my friends. This should not have been, this new code should not have been called revised corporation code. It should have been called code of corporate governance because it is full of corporate governance measures. Okay? Beneficial ownership report. Company must now, the corporate records of the company must contain information on beneficial ownership of share. What does that mean? For example, if a fund in the U.S. invests in my company, and we all know that funds are beneficially owned by several people, does it mean that the company has now to keep information about the, in, the, in the investors of this fund, the so-called ultimate beneficial test. It is for the SEC's implementing rules and regulation to determine up to what extent should this provision on beneficial ownership extend, uh, go. Right of inspection, the code recognizes the right of inspection of shareholders, but makes it a mandatory obligation of the inspecting shareholder to keep confidential things as they are. Not only confident, but things that are privileged under our rules of court. For example, you have trade secrets under intellectual property law, the Data Privacy Act, the Securities Regulation Code, and the rules of court. So, pati yung attorney-client privilege, okay? Uh, that has to be respected by the inspecting 
uh, by the expecting shareholder. I really don't know whether this will result in the waiver of the attorney-client privilege. Do I have students here? In evidence? Okay. Requirement for approval by the Philippine Competition Commission. Okay. If a company sells an asset, okay, or disposes an asset, and it crosses the threshold found uh, under the PCC rules, for example, I think the transaction value is two billion, two point something billion, and five point two billion for the size of person test. That company cannot sell the asset unless it makes notification to the PCC, and where appropriate, get SEC a PCC approval for the sale of that asset. Is that good? I've heard many companies complaining. Okay, note that this law does not even require that the sale of assets will result in control. It just says sale of assets, a sale or disposition of assets. I understand mergers and consolidation, but I don't know about increase and decrease of capital stock. The issue is does the company have to go to the PCC? But it's there. It's under Section 37. I don't know what that means, and I think the SEC has to resolve that one way or the other in the IRR. <coughs> Arbitration. Paborito ko ito. We now read of many cases on intracorporate disputes. For example, the case of uh, that hospital in Ortigas. <laughs> Medical City. Involving Dr. Bengson and his... Uh, I think nephew, say Eki Gonzalez. It's all over the papers. Every move is in the papers. So it's a, it can get to be embarrassing. And while I'm a lawyer, those litigations, intracorporate disputes, are really expensive. The RCC now provides an opportunity for corporations to avoid that expensive litigation, to avoid public embarrassment by adapting in its articles or bylaws arbitration as a mode of dispute resolution. You know, I was part of the rules of procedure of the Supreme Court Committee that revised the rules of procedure on intercorporate disputes. We made it as short as possible, but I think it's violated more in, uh, it's uh, honored more in breach than in compliance. Okay? So arbitration, if you want, if you don't want to wash your dirty linens in public, I suggest that your company amend your bylaws and your articles to make arbitration as a mode of dispute resolution for intra-corporate disputes. Okay? I think this is one thing that the new corporation code, revised corporation code, has given in order to maintain peace, to at least avoid embarrassment uh, to the company and the directors and officers involved. Now, as uh, uh, Senator DeLon and Dean Villanueva said, there are now penalties. For example, if you're a board and you tolerate graft and corruption, okay, and you are a director and you approve disclosure of incomplete or accurate information, okay? Or if you collude with your independent auditor, okay? Or you aid and abet commission by, of crimes by your officers and colleagues in the board, okay? Or you retaliate against whistleblowers, the revised corporation code have penalties for you. So, I think uh, that's it for challenges and opportunities. Uh, I hope I did not extend, but um, I could have done so if I wanted to discuss the side-by-side -side comparison. But I think the changes I also discussed when 
ay discuss these opportunities and challenges under the RCC. Maraming salamat. Can we have the, the hotel staff please prepare the panel seat? Thank you, Francis. And thank you also again to Attorney Dean Cesar. Uh, Attorney Slim and uh, Villanueva back on the stage as I introduce the other panel uh, members. Francis and Cesar, would you like to take take your seats of the Ida? Where will you sit? At the far end, okay. So we're now going to the panel discussion of the revised corporation code. And to assist our panel and moderate the question and answer exchange, we have finally a non-lawyer and a female. Uh, a CEO specializing in turnaround interventions for corporations in trouble. She was also actively involved in drafting the revised corporation code. I think many of the recommendations that she made have also been adopted. She is vice chairman of the governance committee of the Management Association of the Philippines and a fellow and trustee of the Institute of Corporate Directors. Please welcome Imelda or Ida Tiongson on the stage, please. Ida. Our next panelist is the Chief Legislative Officer of Senator Drillon. She co-drafted the Revised Corporation Code law along with other laws in the 17th Congress, including the Revised Penal Code Indexation, the Rice Tarification Law, and the Tax Amnesty Law. She spent some time with Picasso, Bus Buico, Tan, Fider, and Santos, but spent a lot of most of her time in government having served as spokesperson for MMDA, Permanent representative to the Climate Change Adaptation and Mitigation Presidential Cabinet Cluster, and as convener to a number of traffic, solid waste, and urban renewal programs. She was a member of the Board of Directors of the LRTA and the LLDA, and she has also served as the Board Secretary of the Metro Manila Council and the Metro Manila Film Festival. She is, she is a member of the New York Bar Association since 2012 and is currently a professor at the Ateneo Law School teaching environmental law. Ladies and gentlemen, from the office of Senator Franklin DeLon, please welcome attorney Maria Luel Hati Dorotan Tioseco, or ALU for short. Our next panelist is the CEO of ICD and an independent director of the board of SM Investments Corporation and Mega White Construction Corporation. He was past president of UP, during which time his, the performance was recognized with the Presidential Lincoln Bayan Award. Prior to becoming an academician, Mr. Pascual worked at the ADB for two decades as Director for Private Sector Operations and Director for Infrastructure Finance. He sat on the board of several ADB investees in various industries in China, India, and the Philippines. And prior to that, he was a finance professor at AAM for 10 years and lecturer at the Ateneo de Manila. Currently, he's president of the Rotary Club of Makati, a life member of Phoenix, a trustee of Sheffield, and a former governor of the MAP. Let us welcome Sir Fred Pasqual to the panel. Fred, please. <laughs> then we have our next panelist for over 20, 40 years. 
22 of which were spent outside the Philippines. Our next panelist has served as a prominent investment banker, financial advisor, investor, and financial entrepreneur specialized in Asia-related businesses. When he returned to the Philippines in 1977, he, become an ex he, beca he began an extensive not-for-profit involvement in education, corporate governance, and economic inclusion. He served, among others, as president and CEO of AIM, chairman of the board of trustees of De La Salle University, chairman of the DBP advisory board, and chairman of the AFP multi-sectoral governance council. In addition to co-founding and running several successful financial services businesses in the region, he has served in over 40 private and publicly listed corporations in Hong Kong, ASEAN, Australia, and the United States. Among the local corporations he has involved in as board member are Film Life, Ayala Land Inc., EDC, RCBC, RCBC Savings, EI, Clean Asia Philippines, De La Salle, and the Sociedad Española de Beneficencia. He also serves on the strategy committee of the Global Network of Directors Institute, a leading global exponent of global corporate finance and best practices. He is a fellow of the Institute for Solidarity in Asia and is currently a fellow and chairman of the Institute of Corporate Directors. Ladies and gentlemen, Francis Estrada. And finally, the man of the hour, our last panelist, Emilio Benito Aquino was appointed as SEC Chairperson by President Duterte on June 6, 2018. He is the first CPA lawyer to have assumed this post. Earlier, he was a SEC Commissioner. His present round of appointments marks his return to the SEC, where he rose to the ranks to become the youngest director of its former prosecution and enforcement and non-traditional securities and instruments departments. He also had the SEC Davao and Sambanga offices. And upon his upon assumption, he sh helped shepherd the immediate passage of the RCC, which is now the subject matter of our forum. He's a com incumbent chairman of Working Group D Corporate Governance Initiative of the ASEAN Capital Market Forum, which awards the top 50 companies with the highest ranking in, in the corporate governance scorecard. Given his experience, Chairperson Aquino was able to reduce substantially the initial walls encountered by SEC on the online registration system, and thus under his leadership was conferred early this month the plaque of honor of the Presidential Anti-Corruption Commission in Malacanang. Please welcome Chairman Emilio Aquino of the Securities and Exchange Commission. I've previously given you the Slido directions, so I hope you had downloaded the Slido. And with that, I'd like to turn over the panel discussion to Ida. Okay. Ida, please. All right, thank you, Ms. Boots. Okay, the, the hour we're waiting for, but we don't have an hour. We have 45 minutes, given the time. So um, I'll start with the housekeeping matters first. You do have Slido. In case you do have a similar question in the Slido, do click it so it will move higher. So the number of likes or the number of clicks, um, that would give us that uh, point of actually getting that particular question. But we can take and we will be taking questions from the floor as well. Just put your hand up. We do have um, people there that will provide you your mic microphone. Um, please introduce yourself as well as um, uh, uh, advise us on who are you directing your questions to. Okay, so um, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with the reactions first from the other panelists on the keynotes and presentations. Let's start with Dr. Fred first. A very quick reaction. We heard that one of the good things about the RCC is that it brings about ease in doing business. But in the presentation of uh, Tony Francis Lee, we, we see the uh, tremendous requirements, you know, for reporting, disclosure, and uh, other uh, matters that the corporation will, have, will now have to comply with. Uh, so we see here a counterbalance of ease of doing business and the burden of public disclosure. Well, of course, transparency, which we promote as a part of good corporate governance, 
is something that has to be kept in mind. Okay? We also heard about the tremendous power that are, that's now in the hands of uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, I would be uh, waiting for our chairman of SEC to explain to us to what extent the structuring of SEC will now be uh, done, if there will be a uh, significant uh, increase in the staffing or, or new positions that will be opened in the Commission to be able to cope with the so many open-ended uh, issues with respect to RCC as explained to us by our two presenters. But uh, in the end, of course, we expect that uh, the SEC will be guided by the principle that uh, we need to maintain institutional stability in our corporate sector so that companies in the Philippines will be in a position to contribute long-term benefits to society. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fred. May you also get a reaction from Chair Francis? Thank you. Uh, like, like everybody from the private sector, obviously we are, we are grateful, we, are, we welcome the uh, updating of the Corporation Code. Uh, as representatives of the ICD though, let me express uh, a couple of points of view. First, what we welcome, and second, what we hope to clarify. What we welcome very much is a very clear distinction something we believe in between what is management role and what is the board role. The board's role is governance, the formulation and approval of strategy and policies, and oversight. Management is responsible for execution. And of course, the devil is in the details in execution. That's point number one. But it was, I think, very clear throughout that it was very, and it's very important and we welcome it. The second piece really is more strategic, more philosophical, if you will, that the law underlying the legislation is a recognition of a major paradigm shift that, uh, that uh, you know, that, are, that have been, has been referred to. And that shift has really had two dimensions. One on the role of enterprise in society. The first principle is that there has been a shift from maximization of shareholder value as the reason for being of an enterprise, and that refers to both majority and minority shareholders. The second piece has to do with the purpose and the, and the stakeholder, the movement from shareholder interest to stakeholder interest. More particularly, when we speak of stakeholders, we are saying Apart from minority and majority shareholders, we have employees, we have the entire supply chain. Supplier, the value chain, suppliers, distributors, uh, and the markets and communities where enterprise operates. We think that this is fundamental and very, very important. Obviously, it will be in the implementation, the implementing rules and regulations that we will find clarity in a lot of these issues. And we hope, as all of us do, uh, to be able to help and be useful and helpful to the Commission in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And of course, Chair, it's also adapting to best practices in ASEAN uh, score, yes. Um, I'd like before uh, Chair uh, Aquino, uh, Attorney Alu as well, um, because she was actually there when the draft of this is actually happening, so we'd like to get a reaction from you and how these things came about. Um, as communicated by Senator Drillon previously, um, he was really excited after the, the economic, uh, the, the introduction, after, yes, after we introduced so many economic bills in the 16th Congress, literally, first day of 17th Congress, he asked, what bills should we shepherd? And of course, at the top of the list is the Corporation Code, no doubt about that. We were the chairman 
of the Committee on Constitutional Change and Revision of Laws. So right then and there, we asked for the comments of the, uh, we, we called Chairman Herbosa, and then we asked for the comments of the, all the stakeholders, and we had, we scheduled committee meetings, and then had two TWGs well attended, and then all the comments were taken, and then that's why we have this. And then once we, well, we, um, just a little bit background, uh, we, we were really fast um, in moving from the committee to the plenary until we, we, we had an issue in the Senate. Uh, it's about the nationality. So um, the, the senators were, were divided on the issue whether or not we have to quantify the Roy versus Herbosa or allow it, the Supreme Court to, um, to have a say about it. So at the end, it, it's, it, it got stuck there for a while. And then finally, we said, that if we have that law, then we need to quantify since the SEC has that um, case anyway. So no amendment on that section. And then right after we approved the, the version of the Senate, we handed it to the House of Representatives and except for the removal of the minimum paid up capital, we didn't, they didn't touch anything else. Just uh, typos and all that. And so we have this. Thank you, Attorney Alu. And um, last but not the least, the man in the, I'm not going to say hot seat, it's actually cool seat, um, considering the power. Um, reaction, uh, Chair Emil. Um, there's a few points that mention the revival, the possible one peso corporation, requirement of corporators, the OPC. So, picked um, which one in terms of um, reaction? Either can I request my day in court. <laughs> if I can take the podium, so I, I can answer all the queries that were raised. So that, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Huh? Say it, thank you. Di pa closing remarks to? Good afternoon, everyone. Apparently, you don't feel that fine anymore after hearing all the presentations. At the outset, I'd like to say that it's not the only uh, it's not only the SEC who uh, introduced all those uh, revisions. Uh, you have these guys up here in front. <laughs> now, I believe everyone will agree when I say that the Revised Corporation Code is a landmark legislation for introducing progressive provisions, which are largely geared toward enabling the corporate sector to thrive, grow, and contribute bigger to our pursuit of sustainable and inclusive growth. I'd like to thank immensely Senator Drillon, being the principal author and sponsor in passing this landmark legislation. I'd like to uh, assure the good senator that SEC will definitely not stifle business initiatives. Uh, we have always been open-minded. In fact, uh, the agency has just been uh, recognized for innovative measures to, uh, for, the, for efficient and effective uh, delivery of uh, public service, as well as the curtailment of um, corruption. If at all, we are concerned of just the bad behavior of actors in the corporate world. So if you're not a bad actor, you don't have to worry. As of the end of 2018, we have 653,934 active corporations with 362,596 partnerships. So imagine if we can actually tap the potential of all these entities. We are looking at more than 1,000 corporations and partnerships. And you may even add the almost 2.5 million sole proprietorships with active business names registered with the DTI. Uh, the introduction of the OPCs in the RCC uh, sees a good potential of this MSMEs uh, or sole proprietorships um, converting to this new corporate vehicle with limited liability feature. Now, let me just state that uh, early this month we have already released proposed guidelines 
on the establishment of a one-person corporation and on the conversion of ordinary stock corporation into offices for public comment. Um, meanwhile, the draft guidelines on the conversion of ordinary stock corporation clarifies that only stock, domestic stock corporation may be converted into an OPC and that single stockholder may only apply for conversion after acquiring all outstanding capital stock of the corporation. On corporate terms, uh, just last week, we also released for public comment the draft guidelines on how a corporation may retain its present corporate term as specified in the Articles of Incorporation. We uh, prescribe that a decision to retain the co specific corporate term of a corporation must be approved during the stockholders' annual or special meeting. Okay? So, uh, just to react or respond no, to some of the points that were raised by our legal eagles here present. Um, on the matter of entering into partnerships, corporations, it has been the subject of academic discussion, corporations cannot enter into partnerships. Normally, it's just joint ventures. But if you will note, in the RCC, corporations can now become partners. But our initial respond probably here is that they can only be limited partners. We have to consider the concept or principles of the lectus personae, personae, where you need the mutual trust and confidence among partners. If at all, he's just a capitalist as a limited partner. Okay? And uh, on the revival, which is really a very, very valid uh, issue, revival of corporations, we are looking at corporations who may have already, whose term has already expired, but then they're still going concern, or more likely they just overlook that their term has already expired. If you are going concern, and, we, and you can show to us proof that indeed you are continuing your business, not realizing that you have already expired, we will definitely consider. Now, the challenge is how far back do we go, especially those who have undergone liquidation and all that. Uh, initially, there's a phrase that was in, uh, placed there, at any time, but that was taken out. This apparently the, the intention is just really you have to, you, you cannot just go back to probably in the 1950s, no? uh, because for practical reasons, you won't be able to convene the incorporators if they are still alive. Okay. So, if at all, there is a transitory provision providing two years. Uh, we're still trying to sort out this part. It's a bit tricky how far back, but you have that transitory provision allowing, you know, for corporations to be able to comply within that period. You see, it cannot be endlessly also. Okay, and then appraisal rights are allowed by express provision of Section 11 of the RCC. The, the one who doesn't want to continue on uh, and would like to stick to the fixed term can avail of appraisal rights. Um, on the 25-25% EODB, we have the accountants who are complaining, how can you even check? Because we, we're so used to the 25%, subscribe, 25% paid up, but then this is part of EODB initiatives. Uh, we have to take that out. If you really want to go into business, really leave it up to you how much capital you need without us prescribing the minimum. So, ang um, point lang naman doon is, again, for practical reasons, would you like to put it, say, for a 1 million peso company, you put in 1 peso subscribed capital and 1 peso paid up capital. Legally, you can do that. But then, would you do that? Diba? When we took out the minimum paid up capital, meron din yun eh also an EODB uh, thing. Uh, because there used to be, remember, minimum of paid up capital should be 5,000 pesos. Now what's 5,000 pesos nowadays? Probably yung cost mo na yung just to incorporate is more than that already. So you, you would not really you know, go for a minimum 5,000 pesos uh, paid up capital. So we leave it actually to, you know, the, the point is you are given options. Okay. Um, yeah, the thing that was mentioned by Attorney Alu about uh, the entire Sandy Capital stock and the entire voting equity, the nationality test, which was actually raised by uh, Attorney Villanueva, we, we stuck to it instead of um, based on the 60-40 on all classes of shares. So it has to be like the entire voting equity and entire Sandy Capital stock. Now, 
on the independent directors, again, I think it was uh, Attorney Francis Lim who did say that he was the one who introduced that amendment. So don't blame us for the rigid uh, <laughs> or that power that was conferred to the SEC, you know, to be able to uh, more or less uh, count by way of rules the number of board sheets you know, and all the stuff. Remember, we're just there. We're not there to run your corporations. Our intention is just that you know, there are no abuses by, by stockholders, especially the majority. Uh, I, I wrote here uh, no proxies, um, no minimum number of directors. Again, it's really up to the, the corporation. You, you'd like to have two directors, why not? It's up to you. Legally, we cannot tell you don't, don't put two, but would you consider just two directors? I don't think so. Except you'd like to pull the talents, right? of other people. Um, on that point, on sole uh, one person corporation versus corporation sole, actually, ang difference lang dyan, yung corporation sole, of course, they manage the temporalities of the, of the church, you know, or the sect, you know, that. Um, we don't even require the submission of uh, general information sheets or financial statements. Because, I, I think part of the Ano yan eh, the state and the church divide. So it is a bit different. Uh, uh, um, and and uh, we have no, of course, but religious societies or associations, they're still bound to submit to us the general information sheet and financial statements. It's different. It's like any ordinary corporation or stock cor uh, non stock corporation. I, I do agree with the term that you gave, uh, si Attorney Villanueva, on incorporated sole proprietorships. Ganun po yun eh. Talagang sole proprietorships with limited liability. That's why they are just uh, incorporated. Uh, on the points raised by attorney Francis Lim, yung minimum, yun, I already mentioned this, you want two, you, have, you want four, you want five. We, ju we just gave the maximum. Okay? No minimum. Number of directors. Again, your choice. On trustees, um, I, I said the presentation, previews one, uh, you're, you're right, Attorney Lim, na, uh, of course, directors have only one year, right? Your term. Trustees, in place there, one, it was made to three. But by practice sa uh, SEC, and analogously, we use the yung term ng founder share, which is five years. Pinapayaga natin, term of five years. Okay? But this time, with the RCC, it's very specific. There was no express provision uh, on, on the number of years that one can serve as a term. Now it's uh, very specific, it's just three years. Very much like schools, diba? you divide it by multiples of five. And then um, records. Records are confidential, but not to the regulators. Except that we cannot just you know, uh, give out those uh, those whatever confidential data that we, we get hold of. Uh, treasurer being a resident, the initial the the initial provision here was for treasurers to be um, directors. And 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 see si, si Chair Francis was mentioning about the divide between the management and the and the directors, the policy makers. We we uh, noted that. So instead of having another executive director we said, no, he doesn't have to be. The treasurer need not be a director. Puede na siya, at least resident. We, we just want, you know, some accountability. You know, guess to sign all the FS and all that to be here in our country. Um, on the maj yung majority being residents, we have to be content the fact that people are, you know, are all over. You can just do a Skype or FaceTime. You can you can participate. In, in fact, we do that. I, I see it as chair of CIC. Uh, Karamihan pon, pon patch or some page time. So you do not really have to be physically uh, there. Except that please note that under section 52, wala pa rin tayo, uh, no proxy rule for directors. You have to be, uh, you may be elsewhere, provided again, it's provided in your articles of incorporation. Uh, you have to participate yourself personally. Uh, I'm almost done. You mentioned about the pro-life of Attorney Liu again. You, uh, you, if you get to pass February 23, because that's effectivity, 
And and uh, you all later on you said oh, we change your mind. Tuloy na lang natin. The the provision is to pay for perpetuity or perpetual existence. So uh, assuming you have gone through the process, wala pa naman. Basta so long as you your term has not expired and you have not shortened your term before February 23, 2019, you're still good. Okay. Um, by the way, this is a very important provision which was taken out in the case of pounders. Pounders kasi, I remember the anti-perpetuation provision mentioned by uh, Attorney Lim. Tinanggal na natin yung ano, pounders kasi, originally as, as provided in the old corporation code, five years lang po yan. Uh, from the date of incorporation. Then there was an, a, an, an amendment that was proposed which was from approval or date of incorporation to approval of the increase in capital stock. We took that out. So, even if you have an increase in capital stock after five years, you cannot continue be, to be pounder. Wala na po, you stop there. Okay? Um, yeah, no residency requirement, there's already remote uh, operation. I think, and then yung adequately financed, I think that's a good point raised by uh, Attorney Villanueva. Pero I would like to believe, yung reason lang naman that adequately financed is in, in conformity. Kasi remember, they have a limited liability feature and we look at the trust fund doctrine, more likely sa beginning lang yun. Because you don't want, you know, some unscrupulous individuals putting different corporations and scamming people. Uh, so, it's just like your subscribed capital stock. You subscribe there, it doesn't change. Diba? So, you just have to make sure the time when, when you open it up, it started, you were adequately financed. There are so many things I, I, I would like to raise. But, eto na lang po. We still have our uh, proposed guidelines. Feel free. We want you to get your comments so that we'll be able to improve it. So that, you know, we don't go overboard. Okay? Okay, you know. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, reminder lang because, um, you know, this is 39 years since the last amendment. It's really a harmonization of the ease of doing business, the um, Philippine Competition Act, uh, Securities Regulation Code, Foreign Investment Act, some sex circulars, and it also codifies internationally accepted best practices. And when it was actually done, it was... Um, uh, uh, you know, when you, there, there's always, when there's reaction, there's an op opposite reaction. Um, we're looking at more the positive, positivity side on the revised corporation code as well. Um, I'll just, uh, since we don't have yet a couple of uh, questions there, I'd like to start again back to, um, sorry, if, if I may just uh, take this up. Uh, SEC jurisdiction, um, the authority, the expansion, bigger powers given to SEC, such as dispute, right to inspect, order elections, hold meetings to resolve disputes, dissolution. Well, basically, it's a it's a huge power, including um, CDO powers. How can um, it's more of a positive question? Okay, how can this help regulators fast track decisions and disputes? Because I un understand there's a, a lot of this uh, going on, or there's. Um, uh, a lot of disputes or decisions that needs to be addressed by SEC. Okay, um, I, I think the reason for this is first is really protection of stockholders, pri primarily minority stockholders. I uh, remember si Attorney Francis Lim mentioned about dirty tricks of some of our compañeros. I have experienced that. We, we arrived 105. Pag, I was a, then a young lawyer and I was acting as an observer. When we reach the room, the no, may the presiding officer there being no other matters to consider. This meeting is now adjourned. Boom. So what happened to the elections? I mean, we just affirm that they're done. That's part of those dirty tricks. This time around, po hindi na pwede, kasi you are required to put up those minutes. And then if in fact there are actual dissent, dissenting uh, uh, remarks, that has to be placed there. But be rest assured to your. SEC, hindi naman po kami ano lang eh, uh, puro naman minority. Ibabalance natin yan eh. We are mindful also. If there is such a thing as a, the tyranny of the majority, meron din po yung tyranny of the minority. We, we are aware of that. Strike suits just to hit. Get, alam po namin yan. We will consider that. 
hindi na namin, hindi na ba't we just get give in and hit people there just because you know, somebody complains to us. Just so, if you have the numbers, just hold those elections. Kasi ang dami ni nag-hold ng election eh. O hindi nag-conduct ng meetings. No, then no quorum. But under the RCC, it, it, that guy who complains is by himself quorum. So be a bit careful about that. And on the part of the SEC, if he comes complaining and the majority would not come forward, definitely we'll, we'll, we'll have to recognize it because that's under the law. Yes. Kahit walang share po, eh, yun ang nakalagay. And I, I, I think, it, was it you who... <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hey guys, ah, ito, ang daming principles of good corporate governance that was inserted there. It is yeah. the job of ICD. Yeah. You know, Giving rights they, to stakeholders, yeah. Really, yeah. including yes. minority. Yeah. Including you, Ida. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, you were very active as well in passing this. Yes. Ang bottom line is, don't, I mean, you should not be afraid doing all these things because you're, we can never go wrong by doing what is right. Eh. Dapat lang eh. Diba? Okay, um, let's start on the slide, Earl. There's um, the first question here. Will SEC be issuing memorandum circulars to provide guidance on certain provisions of the RCC or should we expect implementing rules and regulations instead? Okay, the short answer there is uh, the first thing. We'll, there are specific provisions that will entail some clarification. Yeah, so, it, more uh, MCs, more rules and regulations, not a general IRR. Right. And in fact, um, there, there are two that uh, up to March 29 uh, on one person corporation under public consult consultation. You still have That's up to March right. 29 to comment on that one. And the beneficial ownership, which is yeah. up to uh, June 30, I yeah. think, on that one. But it doesn't mean that yeah. after the end of March 29, we'll not allow you to right. still comment. But somehow, somewhere, I mean, <laughs> meron pa rin tayong timeline to observe. But we will definitely welcome your comments. All right, we'll check out the next question here. Next question, please. Limitations on foreign ownership of corporations. Who would want to take that one? The special laws would still apply and the foreign investment code would still apply. Sorry, talking about the, the foreign investors, and uh, this is actually more of another question, if I may just add this in. Foreign uh, corporations cannot give political donations. Um, this assumes that the locals can give political donations. Is this correct? And what's the premise behind this? If I recall it correctly, the original pro provision prohibited domestic corporations. Yes. That, that was... Um, amended to limit the prohibition to foreign corporations. So, yes. ergo, whether you know, That's but subject right. to the rules of the COMELEC, I assume. The idea here is really everyone knows that domestic corporations are contributing yeah. or are involved in the, um, the political activities. So, Senator Drillon was saying this is a small way of you know transparency and then a small way, but it will go a long way. At least that if you declare your source, we'll know who has conflict of interest. But yeah, it's basically we're actually showing that you can. Um, it's no longer uh, bowel to to have the locals contribute. Okay. Um, is there a limit to number of OPCs per person, especially in context of estate planning? Well, the original provisions had a limitation that one OPC per sing, single stockholder and and that has been removed. Uh, the, the implication of that of course is that um, MSMEs do not need a lot, right? But the removal of that actually opens the field to money people because now they can do one OPC per, per person or per child or per spouse. The other thing that is that should be considered. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean that. <laughs> but that's possible, right? The other thing is that if you look at the code on one-person corporation, it actually says natural person, a trustee, and an estate, right? A trustee is a natural person, of course, right? But it's also possible, therefore for a large corporation 
to appoint a person as thus trustee and incorporate that, uh, that uh, property of the corporation, assigning him as the trustee and the single stockholder. There's nothing in the, right now in the corporation code that prohibits that single corporation to execute rights of first refusal, right? To be able to bind him his cor as long as he remains stockholder of record. So unlike, unlike before where the corporation itself, uh, the intention is the corporation cannot form a single one-person corporation. The fact is the trustee, it can through that trustee. So uh, in short, we're saying that it can be abused um, so it, here no, I'm, I'm not saying that that's an abuse. I'm just can. saying that it becomes a more pliant medium for large businesses rather than for yes. single yeah. proprietors. I mean, Attorney Alus dying to actually answer this. <laughs> so here we go. The original proposal contains a prohibition that multiple OPCs cannot be allowed. However, during the deliberation in the plenary, it was recognized that a person may want may want to engage in different kinds of businesses and put up OPCs for a particular, can go and boss, company, and then agriculture, and so on. So the answer is there's no limit. No limit. And on the other side is it may be abused. I think that's, uh, we, we need to be, um, uh, we need to not, not necessarily worry, but uh, know that for a fact. Okay, can a stockholder request inspection? and reproduction of minutes of board meetings. I think this, this is actually answered from what you, you mentioned. Yes, yes, I think this is answered. What can we expect? The RCCR, oh, okay. I think we already mentioned there's no IRR, so we'll go to the third one. Can the compliance officer omit? Can the compliance officer be an outsider or not an employee of the corporation similar to the position of corporate secretary. Um, if an employee, no? Okay, um, strictly speaking, a corporate secretary is an insider. Diba? Kahit abogado yan sa labas, he's an insider. For, even for purposes of the Securities Regulation Code, no? I think what you really mean, must he be an employee, regular employee of that company? Uh, so, so how, how is it in terms of implementation? How can a compliance officer not... Can, for example, uh, yeah. can a company appoint one of the associates or a partner of their external law firm, external counsel, to be a compliance officer? Uh, I think that's what is meant there. I guess it's not yeah. restricted. It's not restricted, but for. Um, Kasi sa, 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 compliance officer lang can be external, di ba? Ha? Pero yung problem ay, ay ano yung operational difficulty yan, yeah, Because if you are an outsider, ha, how do you ensure that you comply? Especially if the compliance officer will also take the cudgels or the duty of making these disclosures, di ba? Precisely. So, although legally puede, but your standard is of being penalized if you have an outsider as a compliance officer. A sample of that is actually in the Privacy Act, your compliance officer and that one, how can you yeah. not be an insider? So, for practical purposes, it's... So, legally, yeah. puede, but theoretically. Yes. But from my practical standpoint, uh, personally, I don't suggest it. Of course, it may mean legal fees for lawyers, but uh, from a practical standpoint. Uh, if the title is as officer, yeah. it means he's part of the corporate. That can be one argument. That's why the guide, guidelines or the uh, no, IRR of the SEC can address that. No? But the laki ng risk, yeah, based on my experience, kung compliance officer mo outside there. Exactly. You said, no, that, that's the thing. You know, there's a big responsibility to be a compliance officer. Uh -oh. You're like the gatekeeper. In the event, SEC finds out that you didn't, you, you were sleeping on your job. Pero ako nasa PSE ako. May estudyante ako naging compliance officer who at the same time was in charge of disclosure. Na, na penalize namin yung company. Yung internal rules pala ng company niya, if there's a violation of the disclosure rule, dinidetect sa salary. Nakiusap yung 
Estudyante ko sa akin, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. So, ano ba? 50,000 yun. Okay. So, yung sinasabi na ni Kier, laking responsibility yan eh. It could amount into millions even eh. Oo. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yes. Sometimes your company can get penalized billions. Yes. Huh? Especially in the privacy. Um, may I, uh, there may be some questions from the audience. Just put your hand up. Um, if we don't see anyone putting the hand up, we'll continue with the Slido. Um, for the, the couple of questions about beneficial ownerships, um, this is under public consultation, so if I may leave that for now. But uh, we, okay, uh, does this immediately admit requirement of condominium corporations to be 60-40? No change, No, right? no change. Um, next one. Does the provision on disclosure, oh, oh, I beg your pardon, how will the ordinary Filipino benefit from the changes in the revised court code? That's a, that's a big scope. Um, Very profound question. <laughs> no, just maybe uh, in, in practical terms. <clears throat> you remember that uh, the reason for all the attention to cor corporate governance and corporate governance practice, that began with the Asian crisis in 1997, the financial crisis. And then subsequently, the global financial crisis in 2008. And what, was happened, what happened in both of those cases is after the major multilaterals, the OECD, et cetera, the IMF, everybody reviewed what happened. The conclusion was you do not resolve that problem purely by financial ratios, regulatory frameworks, et cetera. There was something more fundamental that had to be embedded, which was really the underlying values of good corporate governance and best practice. So how will it help? That's number one. Number two, as a consequence, global capital markets, the capital markets are globalizing. And we see the sources of equity, debt, etc., moving into institutions that are larger and much, much, much larger in scale, the sovereign wealth funds, etc. They require the companies that they invest in to meet certain standards of governance. And that, therefore, directly affects the incoming FDIs, the foreign direct investments, and investments into your country. It also makes or breaks the efficiency of our capital markets because it allows you then, to, for, for, well, for good issuers, it allows you to tap a much light, larger pond. So that, in a, in a, it's, a, it's a long story, but that's, that, in essence, I think is a response. If I, if I may add, uh, Francis, uh, the crisis that we have experienced in Asia, as well as the global crisis that came about in late 2000s, were all brought about by uh, the lack of uh, good corporate governance in companies. So I think this RCC is really geared to strengthening the corporate governance uh, policies and practices of companies, hopefully to prevent the recurrence of uh, crisis in the future. Because financial crisis, economic crisis affects everyone, you know, even ordinary Filipinos. If, and if I may add also, like what Singapore, the ones who got burned heavily were, were the small investors. Eh? We just followed. And then all the abuses done by those in management, and even the gatekeepers themselves, the auditors, you know, what happened to Enron and all those, and all those you know, more scandals. So we're trying to protect the small investors, actually. In fact, when we say uh, we are champions of investor protection, what we have in mind are the small ones, not the really, really big ones who can take care of themselves and hire good lawyers. Like, Expensive lawyers. Uh, the, the, these guys here. No, it, it's really the small ones, the underdogs. Yun po ang, in, ano, yeah, that's why we're being supposed to also, uh, fast tracking disputes as well and in the corporations. Fast tracking the disputes as well in the corporations uh, because the power has been given to SEC disputes? as well. Disputes. Yeah. Uh, if, if you will note, uh, yeah. If you will note, po, yung ano, uh, the uh, quasi judicial function of this was taken out. Taken out. The passage of the securities yes. regulation code. But there has been, you know, um, accumulation of cases involving intracorporate yeah. uh, controversies. So, ang nangyari, Apparently, this was among those suggested, not just by the SEC, I think even the, the lawyers uh, who, who said that you have to uh, uh, be able to provide yung alternative dispute resolution so long as it is uh, incorporated in the Articles of Incorporation. Okay. Yes. Can I just 
on, on one hand, to add as well and really congratulate, in, in very, this, although it may not be very popular, one of the things that, that this law has done and what the SEC has done beyond the law in requiring beneficial ownership disclosures, I thought that this has always been very, very substantive because how do you deal with, or how do you know you have related party problems, transactions? How do you know you have nationality or constitutional issues if you do not know who the beneficial owners of corporations imbued with uh, public interest are concerned? So these are, I think, very, very critical. But my last, my own question to you, uh, Chairman, is really that I think the reason why business is inherently uh, suspicious of a lot of regulation is the subjectivity that is involved. How, what practical ways might there be in which uh, there is an opportunity to communicate on very specific issues with you? You, well, subjective, uh, subjectivity, meaning we have discretion in, in passing upon uh, certain issues that are laid before us. Apparently, there are very clear um, standards that, that we need to follow. Um, and, and just going back, just to cite an example, the one that was in arbitration, diba? as I suggested to us, we're not going to be the one who's going to act or serve in the arbitral tribunal. Hindi po. Ang mangyayari is that the, uh, it will be, there will be an arbitration agreement, and then you have the... Uh, they have to agree on the number of arbit arbitrators, including the procedures. And then, and then there will be an independent, a designated third party independent uh, person who will designate who will be the arbitrators. And if that third party fails to do so, appoint, to appoint a set of arbitrators, that's the time they go to the SEC. But then SEC will not just, of course, point blankly say, eto na yung arbitrators. There will be a pool and listing of accredited uh, arbitrators or an organization uh, duly accredited for that purpose. Hindi po as much as possible we avoid we avoid uh, yeah acting ourselves as much as possible. And does that mean that the SEC will empower the arbitrators? Yes, of yeah, course. Okay. They have to, they have to be accredited and, and of course also try to meet our requirements. Yeah. Okay. Initially, I wasn't going to. Oh, sorry. On the issue of the related party transaction. Well, I was surprised to see the listing of the parties uh, that are affected by the law. They're only practically directors and officers, but not stockholders. So as stockholders, with majority control of the ownership, but not an officer nor a director of the company, could technically be outside the ambit of the law. I don't know whether this is intentional or um, oversight. Sure, because in, uh, within the Banco Central, it's DOS, it's directors, stockholders, no, but related to the RCC. Yes. Well on stockholders. Yes, and I think that's where. Uh, well, well, well. Yes. Um, specific laws, um, Attorney Alu, you mentioned that if it's not actually here, it's still be guided by specific laws. If it's BSP, it's BSP, and, and IC, and IC, and that sort of thing. I was thinking of actually skipping the attorney client privilege beneficial, but I think that's a good question, so we should uh, take that up. Does the provision on disclosure of beneficial ownership violate attorney client privilege? Here, here. I think my students in evidence know the answer to this question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why you're surprised to uh, find out that the, there was reference to the rules of court. Kasi kung attorney client privilege, not even the courts of law can compel, compel disclosure of the privileged information. Unlike confidential information, the, court of, uh, the courts of law and the regulators can um, compel disclosure. But attorney-client privilege, not even a court of law, much less um, uh, what we call this, a regulator can compel it. Now, but the general rule, I think I teach this in evidence, I think CD Pauls is here, Okay. General rule, the identity of your client is not privilege. But there may be cases 
where the identity of the client is privileged. And that was held in the famous case of Regala versus Sandikan Bayan. So for the companies, for the practitioners, you have to uh, be aware of that because uh, you may be waiving your uh, attorney-client privilege if you know. There, it's limited instances like naman. For example, where disclosing the name of your client will expose your client to potential criminal or civil liability. I think that's the exception uh, created by the Supreme Court in that Regala case. No? So I don't know how we will deal with that issue. No? Because the are rules of court. Eh? Uh, so I don't know what was really a vision, Alu, when you uh, added that. I think we need to follow that through. Um, we still have to have up to June 30 or June 29 for the beneficial ownership. Uh, it's still because that can that can be an issue yeah, in the new GIS, Mr. Chairman. No? Yes, yes, that's. Oh. So the, I I don't know. The new GIS, the corporate secretaries are required to sign up on beneficial ownership. That's under um, public consultation, and I think that's. Um, it's deferred up to June 30 or June 29, thereabouts. Can Congress enact a law that uh, impinges on the authority of the Supreme Court to yes. prescribe rules of procedure? Yes. Because in our system of law, huh? There's, Separation, no, right? yeah. There's a good intent in terms of looking at RPT and what is RPT if you don't know the real owner. But let's find out the premise behind this beneficial ownership if Attorney Alu can. Yeah, beneficial ownership. So are we saying now that this is a matter of substantive law, okay. not merely a matter of procedure law? Evidence is yes. part of procedure law. Yes. Uh, yes, please. Can I respond? Huh? <laughs> Yes, you can respond, Chair. Uh, you know, I, I'm not ruling. After all, we are eliciting as many comments as there are. But okay. please note that uh, what are we dealing with here? It's a corporate vehicle. Remember, the limited liability yes. feature and all that. So that's why the SEC is a repository of all this information. You know? uh, because somebody would like to invest, there, there's such thing as a, you're limited to the trust fund, which is just a subscription. But you should be given all the information to make a well-considered, you know, decision, investment decision. The, the other, the other thing is, if you go um, IPO, you're a public uh, interest company or like a public company for that matter. Um, we, we, we are our regulatory framework is really full disclosure. We always feel that uh, sunshine is the best disinfectant. Yes. You have to disclose everything. Now and then there's the shift. Um, Especially, itong, hindi lang yan beneficial ownership. It's ultimate beneficial ownership. Ultimate yan. Beneficial. That's right. Meaning, down to the last. Down to the last. Uh, individual. Uh, it's a bit tricky. Actually, I'm going around getting uh, best practices too. But I'll tell you, in, in our last mutual evaluation by FATF, among the things that were considered is, kasi kasama po ito eh, FATF recommend, recommendation number five, where, you know, launderers are there, they layer it, and then try to hide their identity. So the only way to get back at them is to make sure that they are identified. I think the, right. the intent is noble, and the intent on transparency, yeah, it should be there. Except that the, the way that it's, uh, I, I think, being implemented now, there's a lot of corporate secretaries kind of jumping up down saying, why are we having the responsibility? Don't worry that we still have that month, it's, month That's month. still under co a public consultation. <laughs> Um, so where are we? Uh, what is the tax treatment of an individual who incorporates an OPC? Does he need to file two returns, one for him as individual and one for his corporation? Right now, right now that is the case because the OPC is a separate juridical personality, right? And that's the reason why right now, until train two is passed, why OPC is not attractive to MSMEs. Because as a tax, uh, as a tax, uh, as a corporation, as a, it is 30%. Whereas if you remain as a, as a small businessman on a sole proprietorship, it reaches 35% only when you're above 8 million. It's still 25%. So I don't know how much the uh, taxing authorities can do this. 
the ultimate way by which to make uh, OPCs attractive to small businessmen is it becomes a pass-through entity, the way general professional partnerships are. Yeah. Okay, so there, the answer is actually yes. It's two separate filing. Um, we have a question from the floor. Do we have a microphone here? Ms. Mary Vick, uh, President of Phoenix. I don't know if I caught it right, but there was a um, provision saying that uh, the capitalization can be in foreign currency. Uh, in reality, right now, if you're a foreign investor, you can actually you know, uh, remit in dollars, but what is recorded would be the equivalent in pesos. So what is the rationale for including that? Are we saying that corporations now can report their financial operations in foreign currency? I was the one who mentioned that. No, I, that wasn't uh, the statement. The statement was the old provision of the law that required the authorized capital stock to be stated in lawful currency of the Philippines, that has been deleted. That has a consequence. It means before that the intention to limit the capitalization to be expressed in lawful currency of the Philippines has now been removed. It now grants SEC the authority to determine whether it wants, it can move, if it wants to move forward to expressing them in foreign currency. That's just what it means. In other words, it may not. It will still require it in lawful currency of the Philippines. But today, there is that ability of the SEC to do so if it wants to. Yes. Right? Because that's an interesting statement from an accountant. Uh, we do have standards that a company must be reporting its operation using its functional currency. So uh, some companies do produce two financial statements, one in functional currency and then one in pesos to comply with local uh, statutory filings like with the SEC and BIR. So it was quite, you know, quite an interesting point of view. Although the question would be, isn't peso the legal tender and transactions must be in PESO. So I think that would be interesting to find out what the legislators have in There was, there was in mind. no intention to actually allow payments in cryptocurrencies or dollars. It has to be a legal tender for, um, still and it has to be Philippine PESO. I think the, probably it was just by, it was inadvertently deleted, deleted no intention whatsoever to make. <laughs> Also, uh, cryptocurrencies are not legal tender. You simply have to be bound by yung existing laws naman about legal tender. What is legal tender? We only have, um, if there's no uh, question from the audience, if there's none, I, I have like uh, room for one question left. Um, I think when it comes to the grandfather rule, that's already okay, is it right? Okay, so we're, we're moving on. Uh, simple one, are the companies allowed to incorporate using cryptocurrencies? Of course, we're looking at two regulations. Can, can they become, the, yeah, it's the FinTech. I think it, this is a FinTech question, I don't know. Uh, we, I think we responded to yeah. that already. Even the central bank, well, it allows you know payments and remittances done in Bitcoins and all that, but it's never, it has never declared that it is legal tender. So in similar manner, the SEC will not consider that. Okay, there's a lot of questions, a lot of interesting questions, but um, uh, SEC Emil, um, he has flight to catch, so we actually have to wrap up. Uh, much has changed from 39 years ago, thus the need to update and modernize the main body of the corporate law. The revised corporation code not only provides expansion of SEC jurisdiction to be able to hasten or resolve companies' issues, it also aims to encourage entrepreneurship and creation of new businesses, contribute to ease of doing business, better protect the rights of the stockholders and the stakeholders, deter corporate abuse and fraud, and strengthen corporate governance. There are challenges ahead the refreshed, revised corporation code with its proper implementation will help businesses being the engines of our economy and that will redound to better Philippines. Thank you to our panel members and of course let's not forget the present administration for passing this much awaited law. So thank you again.
thank you again, Ida and the panel. Um, would the Chair Aquino wish to make his final remarks, please? Oh, okay, just the closing remarks, I'll make this close, uh, short. Okay, first allow me to commend the Institute of Corporate Governance. Okay, I'll, uh, Corporate Directors, I'm sorry, ICD. Along with the Shareholders Association of the Philippines, Sharepeel, the Institute of Internal Auditors of the Philippines, the Finance Executives Institute of the Philippines, Phoenix, the Management Association of the Philippines, that's MAP, MAP or MAP, the Justice Reform Initiative or JRI, and the Makati Business Club. Thank you for gathering key stakeholders in the implementation of the Revised Corporation Code and providing us the venue to discuss the changes and challenges ahead. This is supposed to be our job, but then they took the initiative for us, so we thank them immensely. Um, so on behalf of the Commission, I'd like again to express our gratitude to Senator Franklin Drillon. Please convey, Attorney Alou. Okay, he being our, the principal author and sponsor of this law. Let me also acknowledge, uh, of course, Attorney Alou, uh, Senator Drilon, ICD Chairman Francis Estrada, President Alfredo Pascual, Sherpil President Francis Lim, and the Chairman of the Corporate Governance Committee at MAP, Attorney Cesar Villanueva, uh, for their invaluable insights. So for almost four decades, the Philippine corporate sector operated within the same regulatory framework, regardless of the changes and developments that have taken place throughout all those years. So BP 2068, uh, or the Corporation Code of the Philippines, was enacted in 1980. Uh, that was when most, if not everyone in the country probably had not heard about or thought of the idea of the internet. So more than 38 years have passed, Almost a fourth of our population have already connected to the internet. New business models anchored on the internet have emerged, but our law have stayed the same until now. Um, finally, we have Republic Act number 11232. Uh, this supersedes BP 2068 and brings our corporate regulatory framework in place with the changing times with its progressive provisions. So I'd like to recognize the private sector which is well represented in this forum for see, seeing through what could understand, uh, understandably be described as additional requirements brought by the revised corporation code. May we continue reminding ourselves that we can never go wrong doing what is right. Going forward, we hope that the private sector's continued support in Realizing every Filipino's vision to sustain and even accelerate our economy's growth and have a strong-rooted, comfortable, and secure life for everyone. So again, I'd like to thank everyone from the speakers, my fellow reactors, the organizers, to the members of the audience for actively participating in this forum. So please do not hesitate. We are keeping a listening ear here. At Please, uh, whatever, comments, well, whether, whether you're supporting it or you're against it, please don't hesitate to send them forward to us through email or even personally to our office at PICC. So with that, thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Chair Aquino. We request you to remain on stage with the panel. Its moderator, Ms. Ida Tiongsan, and our MC, ICD and Sheriffield Trustee, Ms. Boots Garcia. As we go all on stage, Ms. Richelle Mendoza, President of the Institute of Internal Auditors Philippines, to present our tokens of appreciation to speakers and panelists. Ms. Mendoza.